Assalamu alaikum jamiaan. Dear all, welcome. My name is Dr. Lamad Tawil. On behalf of the Saudi Society and the Organizing Committee, I'd like to welcome you all in the second day of our Durham for Non-Durham. Before we begin, just a few reminders. The CME hours, as long as you've registered and are in the room or you registered in the YouTube link, you're probably going to have them. If you just want to view this lecture, you can please just go on our Twitter account and um, sign into the, uh, uh, the link and you can live stream with us. Uh, the lectures are being recorded. You can get back to them at any time later on. Certificates will not be distributed today. A link won't be sent today. You will receive them after we finish this course. I would like to also thank Lily for sponsoring the event and Infotech for helping us run this wonderful event. Now, without further ado, we have a lot of lectures to go through, but our sp first speaker is consultant dermatologist, Dr. Faisal Sabhi from al -Bahran. He'll be talking about hair and everything you need to know about it. So Dr. Faisal, please take the lead. Thank you, Dr. Lama, for the kind introduction, and let me share the slides. One Sorry, just one second. Okay. So can you see my slides? We can see you and the slide. Great. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about an approach to hair loss, uh, which is a very common complaint that we see in dermatology. And uh, the objective of my talk is not to list causes of hair loss, but rather will give you an approach how to take a comprehensive history and perform a thorough physical examination in a hair loss patient and to be able to differentiate between different causes of hair loss and select the appropriate investigation uh, when you see a hair loss and recognize the signs of uh, scarring alopecia that require early recognition and uh, referral to dermatology. Okay. So this is the outline of my talk. So, First, I'm going to talk about the scalp surface anatomy. And it's really important to understand the scalp surface anatomy because uh, hair loss condition appears in different parts of the scalp. And there are areas that we need to recognize and the landmarks that we need to know, such as the frontal hairline, the temples, and the vertex. And these are the areas where the uh, non androgenetic alopecia occur. And, uh, also, the other part of the hair is really important to examine. So this is an important slide to understand the surface anatomy of the scalp. Uh, also, it's important to understand the anatomy of the pilosebaceous unit uh, because it's going to help us understand immunological condition when they occur in the scalp. So as we can see here, this is the skin surface, and this is the sebaceous gland, and right underneath is a bulge. And in the bulge, there is the stem cells, and that's important to understand that if an immunological attack or any destruction happen in the bulge area, that would lead to a scarring alopecia because the hair cannot regrow really again because the stem cells has been destroyed. While if the damage has happened at the dermal papillary level, the hair can still grow back from stem cells that are, has been intact in the bulge area. So it's really important to, uh, to have this concept in mind and we're gonna see why it's important as we progress through slides. And now uh, the hair cycle. It's really important to understand also the hair cycle is gonna help us understand uh, variable hair conditions and why the hair is shedding. So most of our hair are actually in anagen hair. So if you try to pluck a hair from your hair, from your head and it doesn't come out, that's an anagen hair. While if you gently rub your hair on your scalp and you see a hair in your hand, this is basically a telogen hair that can easily fall. So as we said, most of our hair are in anagen and it stays in that phase for two to six years. And then it would shift to catagen that stays for three weeks, which is a transition and becomes more small and more superficial. And then finally into a telogen phase and stays there for three months and then it sheds and falls down. So understanding this cycle is really important as we're gonna see through the slide. So as you can see here, most of our scalp hair is in anagen phase, so it doesn't fall, 90% uh, almost. And 1% is in this transition phase of catagen and 10% is in telogen phase that actually sheds and fall down normally every day. So if we look at these two patients and if we wanna 
if the patient in the left says, I can only grow my hair to my shoulder, it doesn't grow any longer than that. While the patient in the right says, I can easily grow my hair long to my waist. What's the difference between these two patients? It's actually genetics. So this patient on the left, her anagen phase is genetically determined to be two years, while the patient on the right, her anagen phase is genetically determined to be five years. So the hair can stay in anagen for five years and grow long uh, down to the waist. But once the hair has shifted into telogen, it always stays there for three months before it shifts down, falls down. So, so now we're gonna talk about taking history from a hair loss patient. In addition to taking a general history uh, of uh, past medical history and family history, when we look at the HPI, it's really simple. It's the five S's. It's so always a star ask of when did it start? Is it a recent or it's been a prolonged problem? Has it been a fast or a slow uh, hair loss process? And the symptoms, and this is the most important one. Always ask about itching, burning, or pain. I mean, if you get anything out of this presentation is you have always to ask patients who comes in with a hair loss, if they have itching, burning, and pain, and document that in their chart. Then shedding. Shedding uh, means that the hair is falling down everywhere. So if the patient tell you, I see hair in my pillow, I see hair in my sink, I see a lot of hair in the shower, that means they have active shedding. And then lastly, you ask about supplements and medication, and you document that also in the history of presenting illness. And then also in addition to past medical history, past surgical history, allergies, and uh, a general uh, history that you take from the patient. Now, uh, the physical examination. The purpose of the physical examination is basically two steps, to determine where the hair loss is occurring, and also to determine if the hair loss is unscarring or scarring. And I'm going to give you a seven steps approach for a comprehensive hair examination, and we're going to take them step by step. So first we have to raise the part, look for miniaturization, examine the temple and hairline, look everywhere in the scalp, use dermoscopy, perform hair pull test and car test, and do a skin examination for the face, nail, mouth, and the body. So raise the part. Why is the part important? So these are two different patients. This patient has a, almost a normal part of their hair when they parted. This patient has actually increased width of the part. So this is the first observation. And it's also important to notice is the increase in the width only in the top part of the hair or it's also in the occipital area. Why is that important? If it's only in the top part of the hair, that means the patient's most likely going through a female pattern hair loss, which is androgenetic alopecia. While if it's a part is wide in the front and also in the back of the scalp, that means there's a diffuse hair loss. Yeah. Second part is to look for miniaturization. So what does miniaturization mean? Uh, so miniaturization means that there is a hair shaft in different variable uh, thickness. So for example, if you look at this forest and you see all these trees with the same thickness, this will be miniaturization. So you can see there are trees that are really thick and some of them are really thin and there are really small branches. So this is a miniaturization. It's a hallmark finding of uh, androgenetic alopecia, which is also called female pattern hair loss, which is the most common cause of hair loss in both men and women. Third step is to examine the temples and hairline. And it's really gonna give you a lot of in important information. For example, in this patient, if you examine the temple, you see that she's losing hair in this area, but the frontal part is actually uh, still intact. And this is an important sign to give you the diagnosis of uh, traction alopecia. It's called fringe sign. What's happening here actually, because some patients put their hair in a style with in a ponytail or in a braiding, and there's a lot of pressure on the hair follicle. And these hair follicles become fatigued. And uh, after a while, they, beca they become inflamed and fall down while the frontal part has not been pulled. So it is retained. So this is traction alopecia and the patient can get better by just changing the hairstyle. Also, if you look at the temporal area of a woman and you see a massive temporal recession, like in this patient, then you should suspect hormonal abnormality and polycystic ovarian syndrome. Also, when you examine the, uh, the hairline, if you see uh, perifollicular erythema or the hairline is shifting toward the back, that can signify frontal fibrosing alopecia, which is actually a scarring alopecia. So this is a really important sign to be able to recognize early. And uh, also one of the signs of these uh, condition is you see thinning of the skin where you can actually see the veins and you can see lonely hairs. So all these uh, are signs of frontal fibrosing alopecia. For some reason, it's more common in Western countries and uh, it's much less uh, prevalent in our society. 
look everywhere in the scalp. So even if the patient is coming with a hair loss in the front, you have to examine the scalp as a whole, look at the back at the occipital area. And for example, here, if you see pseudopelado broke, this is basically an aftermath of a scarring alopecia that happened in the past. So this can give you a useful information that the patient had some scarring alopecia in the past. And also you might see some other uh, dermatological conditions such as psoriasis. And fifth step is dermoscopy, which is I think it's really important. If you attended yesterday, you can see how important dermoscopy for us as dermatologists is like a, a handheld device performed with magnification and polarized light. So this is how normal scalp look like in dermoscopy. And I should do dermoscopy to all, you, know, you should do dermoscopy to all hair loss patients uh, because it's gonna give you a lot of information as we're gonna see when we go through the cases. So how then a hair pull test. So uh, what is the hair pull test? It's basically you have to take permission from the patient, grab a band of hair, and then gently just pull out. And uh, when you, if you get five or more hairs, that means there's active shedding. And it's an important test to evaluate shedding. And always when you get those hair, put them in a white piece of paper and look at them with a dermoscopy. Look at the root sheet, if it's attached or not. If there is no root sheet attached, that means it's a telogen hair and we expect them to fall. So if there is more than five telogen hairs, that means it's active shedding. If we see an anagen hair, then that should be a red flag that there's a scarring alopecia because as we said earlier, anagen hair should not fall down easily. It has to be forcefully plucked out of the hair. Then the CAR test is gonna also help you reevaluate patients who come with active shedding, such as telogen effluvium. If the patient is coming with a shedding, let's say I have lost a lot of hair in the past three, four months, and then you, basically what you do is you either bring a paper and fold it in half and put it in the hairline and look for uh, regrowth. And as we can see here, this patient has active shedding three months ago, and they're having three centimeter in new hair growing. And that's a good sign that the patient is recovering and they're, uh, telogen effluvium is getting better and they're regrowing their hair, so you can reassure them. Lastly, do a skin exam, like look at the face, nail, and the mouth. If the patient is coming for with alopecia areata, for example, it's important to examine the nails because if they have pitting, that means that the, it gives you a poor prognostic factor and you have in mind that this patient might be difficult to treat and you might need to consider systemic treatment in the future. And also if you see signs of another dermatological condition such as like in planus in the mouth or in the skin, then if they're coming with a hair loss and you can suspect that they might have a like in planar bilabs as well. And also lupus can sometimes present with a hair loss. Uh, we can see either scarring and then scarring. Both of them, they can present in lupus. So now we're gonna go uh, to clinical cases. And in these cases, I'm gonna go into details on some of them, which are the most common and in other of them, and some of them I'm gonna go briefly because of the time. So this is the first case. This is a 35 year old gentleman who's coming with an oval area of hair loss for two weeks. There's no itching, pain or burning. And uh, we're talking about this area here. Otherwise he's uh, healthy. So if we do dermoscopy, this case you can actually diagnose without dermoscopy, but dermoscopy can also give you useful uh, hints. So here we see broken hair and we see yellow dots and black dots. So the black dots actually mean that there's a broken hair with the hair shaft still underneath the skin. So that's the black dot. Yellow hair is actually empty follicles and the exclamation mark hair, it's a hair that has a normal shaft, but here where the immunological attack has been happening at the follicle, the hair became very thin and that gives us the appearance of an exclamation mark. So this is alopecia areata, and it's one of the most common also presentation of hair loss that we see in dermatology. So what is alopecia areata? It's an autoimmune condition. It's associated with an immune attack at the level of the hair bulb. So here, as we said earlier, the attack is happening down at the level of the hair bulb. So that it's not scarring because the stem cells are not destroyed. So the hair becomes weak and fall down, but then new hair, once this immunological attack has resolved, the new stem cells can move from here down to the hair bulb and create a new hair follicle with no remnants. It's usually asymptomatic and it can be associated with another immune disorder such as atopic dermatitis, thyroid disorders, or vitiligo. And if this is the case, then always keep in mind that this can be a difficult to treat case. So if we have another autoimmune condition, then this keep in mind that this might pro require a prolonged treatment and systemic treatment. 
Uh, 50, more than 50% of just localized alopecia yet will spontaneously resolve, even if you don't do any treatment. If it's less than 50% loss of the hair, scalp hair, we can use topical treatment, such as topical steroid or intralegional kinolog injection. And also, I always use minoxidil as well as an adjunct therapy to help hair regrowth in alopecia areata. And you need to apply it only to the area with the hair loss. If it's more than 50% of the scalp, then you might need to do, they need to be done in dermatology clinic as an immunotherapy. And also systemic therapy has uh, changed how we treat uh, alopecia areata, especially with tufacetinib. It's not FDA approved for alopecia areata yet, but it has uh, really changed the game on how we treat, uh, very difficult to treat alopecia areata. How to inject steroid? Uh, always uh, try to use a 10 milligram per ml kinolog and dilute it into half. So fill the syringe half of the 10% milligram per ml and shake it very well and have normal saline or lidocaine and try to inject uh, very superficially in the dermis, not like really deep, but within the dermis and warn the patient about the risk of uh, atrophy. And uh, it's really important not to go above five milligram per ml to avoid atrophy because people think if I inject a higher concentration, I might get faster or better result, but that's not true. Actually, five per milligram per ml works as good as others, 10 or 20, and it has much less side effects. So now we're gonna move to case number two. This is a 32-year-old uh, female who is actually coming with a slow hair loss over the anterior scalp for two years. No itching, no pain, no burning. As you can see, the part is a bit wide in the top. So this might look subtle to you and might be fine. So you might tell the patient there is no, 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 not a big issue, but uh, hair loss for patients have a huge psychological impact. So it's really important to take their complaint really seriously. And even if you don't think it's a an important issue, or it's gonna be a trivial issue, for the patient's hair has a really psychological effect. So this is androgenetic alopecia, and if you look with dermoscopy, you can easily see the miniaturization, where the hair is actually shifted from a telogen hair, which is thick hair, to very fine villus-like hair. So on women, all patients with androgenetic alopecia usually have to get an um, work up in a CBC, TSH, ferritin, vitamin D, and zinc. I do it in all patients. I always uh, would prefer primary care to do this workup before they send any hair loss patient because in addition to androgenetic alopecia or female pattern hair loss, uh, telogen effluvium could also coexist. And other, uh, if the patient is malnourished or the ferritin is low, the vitamin D is low, or the zinc is low, their response to treatment could be uh, uh, not as effective. Also, if the patient has have acne or hirsutism, I do hormonal workup. And if their period is irregular, I do more of an extended uh, hormonal workup and I get in touch with my gynecology colleagues to rule out persistent ovarian syndrome. So the treatment in women, uh, the FDA approved treatment is minoxidil. That is a 2% or 5%. Uh, uh, I think 5% work much better, especially the foam. I am a big fan of using the foam so that we can avoid the irritation and the allergic contact dermatitis that happens from propylene glycol. And it's always important to warn the patient that they might have increased hair loss in the first few weeks of treatment. That's because of the hair that's already in the telogen phase that's gonna fall down, that was supposed to fall down. So it falls down early and the new antigen hair is gonna be growing. So this is a good sign and it's important to let the patient know that so they don't feel that their treatment has caused them to lose more hair. And also to warn the patient about the risk of increase of facial hair, especially if the solution gets in contact with the face by dripping or through pillow. So advise them to put it a few hours before going to bed so they don't have the treatment on the pillow. And also the 5% for women, uh, it's only once a day and it's much easier for them to adhere to this treatment. Other option is to consider androgen blocking medications such as perinolactone. And in a woman of a childbearing age, it's uh, always important to use it with uh, birth control. And uh, perinolactone, you can hit many birds at the same with, with one stone, especially if they have hirsutism or if they have acne so and hair loss. So spinolactone will help, help all these things together. Low level laser therapy is an adjunct therapy. So I usually feel if you give the patient too much things to do and they fail in one of them, they won't do anything. So I think uh, that effect of laser is not as great. And sometimes the patient's really difficult to be compliant to the treatment and especially with the cost. So if I use stick with the uh, minoxidil and if they do this 
alone, I'm happy with that. Hair fibers, if you tell patients to use hair fibers, uh, especially in occasions or in weddings, and they would really, really be happy because it can really camouflage the hair loss uh, in the area and under genetic alopecia, and that boosts their confidence. Hairpiece and scalp micropigmentation can also be, uh, be done. In men, uh, we have uh, other options. The minoxidil is still the same. I prefer the foam and twice a day rather than once in women. Finasteride can be used, but it has a lot of side effects. So it's really important to discuss the side effects with patients. And most of them actually uh, gets, uh, I would say, wouldn't go ahead with the treatment once they hear about the side effects. And it's really important to be clear with patients regarding these side effects, especially sexual side effects that can be uh, uh, could happen in the long term and can be irreversible in some patients. And there's also been recent report, like this was published in November 2020, about increased suicidality with finasteride. So it's an option, it's FDA approved, but it still has a lot of side effects and it's important to discuss it with patients. Hair transplantation, transplantation is a great option also for patients with, for men with androgenetic alopecia and the same other options. So now we're gonna move to another case. Uh, this is a 57 year old female with a slowly loss of hair over the mid scalp for a few months. It could look similar to the patient we just saw, uh, but this patient has a chain pain, and uh, no itching, he has pain and burning. So these are, uh, could be red flags for scarring alopecia. And if we come closer and examine with the dermoscope, we're gonna see a peripheral plugging, and this is a hallmark of uh, lichen planopilaris. And also, as you can see here, the hair, the scalp is actually erythematous, and it's not as healthy as the scalp we saw in dermoscopy of a normal scalp. So always think of scarring alopecia and it needs early referral and urgent referral to dermatology. This is case number four. This is a 42 year old female who's coming with a slow hair loss over the mid scalp for two years, no itching, no pain, no burning. So here, if we look, we can see that this patient has a atypical pattern of a hair loss. So we always go deep with our dermoscopy and we evaluate. So here, when you look with dermoscopy, you're gonna see a lot of important signs for example, you see a black dot, broken hair, but the perifollicular hemorrhage that we can see here, this is actually gonna give it away. So this patient is having trachotillomania, and uh, so they are pulling their own hair. And that's why it's causing broken hair and uh, flame-shaped hair, pigtail hair. And if you ask the patient, you'll be surprised that uh, actually some of them will tell you, And uh, but they will not volunteer the information. You have to kind of ask them and if you ask them, they will uh, tell you, yes, I pull my hair. Especially in children, we see this sometimes. And if you ask the parent, they will tell you, we've never seen our son pulling their own hair. But if you ask a child, they will tell you, yes, I sometimes pull my own hair. And it's gonna save you a lot of uh, investigation to figure out the cause. So this is the fifth case, a 65 year old female coming with a diffuse rapid shedding over the past month. No itching, no pain, no burning. She noticed lots of hair shedding on the pillow every morning. And she had COVID-19 four months ago where she was uh, admitted to the hospital. So this is actually telogen effluvium. So what is telogen effluvium? Basically a trigger happens. And in this patient was, it was a COVID-19 and the admission to the hospital, a stress. And that trigger happened uh, three months ago. And three months ago, the hair has shifted from anagen to telogen. So as we said earlier, telogen hair lasts up to three months. So after three months, all the telogen hair is falling right now. So triggers could be any stress, uh, surgery, any surgery, but especially bariatric surgery can be a cause of uh, telogen effluvium, any endocrine abnormalities, nutritional abnormalities, and also medication. So I think with the pandemic that we're going through, even patients who did not have COVID-19, but going through the stress of a pandemic can induce uh, telogen effluvium. So I think uh, hair loss could be seen in primary care more frequently right now uh, as we go through this pandemic. So the key labs to do in telogen effluvium patient is CBC, check their thyroid function, check their ferritin level. It always has to be above 40, check their zinc level. And as I said earlier, consider ANA as a source systemic lupus. So as a summary of a diagnostic tool that are available to us to uh, diagnose hair loss patients, as I said, all hair loss patients, female exactly, need CBC, TSH, ferritin, vitamin D, and zinc. 
And if the ferritin is low, I would do extensive iron panel. And if you see a patient who coming with a low ferritin and you try to supplement them and it doesn't go up, always think of celiac disease because celiac disease can present as with a telogen effluvium with low ferritin and keep this in mind. Also, if uh, one advice, if you want to supplement the patient with iron, is to ask them to take it with vitamin, with, uh, vitamin C, like an orange juice, because vitamin C will increase the absorption of uh, iron from the iron pills. And if you suspect an autoimmune disease, do an autoimmune panel. And also, if you suspect a patient having a hormonal abnormalities, either you can do the basic hormonal panel or extended. And I ask the patient to do it in the third day of menstrual cycle. So scalp biopsy, we uh, usually do two biopsies uh, if we require to do it in a scarring alopecia case. And uh, because the pathologists need to transect it horizontally and vertically. The vertical transaction will give us an idea of the epidermis, dermis, and where the inflammation is happening. While the horizontal section is gonna give us an idea of the density of the hair and also the ratio between uh, villous hair and terminal hair and antigen and telogen. So the, this is the four millimeter biopsy and it has to be uh, big enough and deep enough to give us the important information we need to evaluate uh, the hair loss. So the take home messages of my presentation always show true concern and compassion with the patient's complaint because it's really psychologically affecting them and uh, always ask about itching, pain and burning, examine the scalp carefully, use dermoscopy and do the basic workup before referring the patient to dermatology. And if you see any of the red flags that we spoke about of scarring alopecia early and urgent referral is important to stop the progressing of this scarring. Thank you so much for your attention and uh, I'm uh, open for any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Pesa. Such an informative and very important talk, matter of fact. We do have a couple of questions to run through. The first question is, um, does seborrheic dermatitis cause hair loss? Uh, sorry, what's the question? Does seborrheic dermatitis cause hair loss? It does, it actually can does. Seborrheic dermatitis can does hair loss as it increases the uh, inflammation. Uh, of the scalp and once they, so it becomes an unhealthy uh, environment for the hair to stay. So chronic inflammation of the scalp for any reason can uh, cause hair loss. So seborrheic dermatitis definitely can cause hair loss, but it's an unscarring hair loss. Great. And what's the role of PRP in androgenetic alopecia? Uh, so PRP, I was expecting this question. It's actually an area of controversy. So uh, some, Experts really recommend it, some experts don't, and uh, it's difficult uh, to see which one is right right now since we don't have enough evidence. Uh, I personally believe it has some effect, and uh, if the patient is willing to endure the cost and to uh, go through the painful treatment, I think it will have some effect. It might prolong the anagen phase uh, or the telogen phase for a certain period of time, so it has to be done in a frequently, frequently to maintain the results. So, I feel uh, if you do it for one time or two times, it's not gonna make a big difference. It needs to be done periodically to maintain the effect. Thank you very much. I think we have space for one more question. Um, is there any way to differentiate between um, alopecia areata and tinea capitis? Uh, dermoscopy, definitely. I did not talk about tinea capitis because there was a great uh, pediatrics infection talk where we see this uh, uh, tinea capitis. But in dermoscopy, if you do dermoscopy, you would see a crook screw uh, hair and tinea capitis, and you would see a lot of scaling, and it could be itching, so which you don't see in uh, alopecia areata. So if you see scaling, itching, and it's usually in uh, children rather than adults, because uh, in children their sebum production is low, and for some reason sebum has an antimicrobial effect. But for adults, they have a high sebum, so they're kind of uh, less likely to see a inf fungal infection in the scalp of adults, but you see it in children. Perfect. Thank you so much. I think we can conclude the session. Very, very nice talk. And if you have time on you and you want to answer them um, in the type in the chat box, that would be great. Um, our next speaker is Thank Dr. You. Afnan Hassanin. She's a consultant dermatologist at uh, King Faisal Specialist Hospital in Jeddah, and she'll be giving a very important talk on emergencies of dermatology. Rare, that's true, but very important. So without further ado, Dr. Afnan, please take the lead. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm just going to share my screen here. Can you see it, Dr. Lemma? 
Yes, it's clear. Okay, so today we're gonna to be discussing the emergency, the top two emergencies that we see here in dermatology. We're gonna obtain diagnostic clues to help us in the diagnosis of Steven Johnson syndrome and toxic epidermal necrolysis. We'll give you a quick overview of the latest treatment paradigms and we'll help you to recognize the erythrodermic or red man syndrome and review, review the differential diagnosis. So these are all cases from my practice. The pictures are from the internet. So case one. You have a 22-year-old female with a history of rheumatoid arthritis. She was doing very well on methotrexate. Her rheumatologist decided to switch her to sulfasalazine due to relapse in her joint pain. Two weeks later, she came to the ER. She had developed these confluent erythematous dusky plaques all over the extremities and trunk. This progressed quickly to involve the mucous membranes as well. Her body surface area on day one of admission was 10% and this quickly progressed to become 30%. So as you can see from the picture on the left, you have these coalescing dusky plaques. If you look closely, you'll actually see like the picture on the left here, slightly raised pink spots with dark red centers. They almost look targetoid like As the disease started to progress in our patient, she developed blistering and peeling of the skin. She had redness and blisters, erosions of the lips and mouth, as well as redness, irritation, pain, and erosions of the eyelids and the eyes. So as you can see here, there's crusting over the glabella, crusting and erosions of the mucosal and the cutaneous lips, a conjunctivitis of the right eye. You see these flaccid erosions all over in addition to the dusky erythematous plaques. On the left, here it was far gone. It wasn't our patient, alhamdulillah. Uh, unfortunately, the, the skin was completely sloughed here. On the right, we had this red erythematous plaque all over the back. Okay, so for those of you that don't know, what is Steven Johnson syndrome? It is the rare serious disorder of the skin and it's classified as a dermatological emergency. It's a reaction either to medication or it could be due to viruses, but it's a little bit less likely. The patient comes in with flu-like symptoms and that was very interesting with our patient because she had actually come in with fever, flu-like symptoms, conjunctivitis, they discharged her home and they said, you have a viral infection. And then she came in two days later with this painful rash that had spread and blistered. The top layer of the skin, when you do a biopsy, what we'll see now in the next slide, the top layer dies, sheds, and begins to heal after several days, but of course with appropriate therapy. So what's the difference between Steven Johnson and toxic epidermal necrolysis? So to make it very simple, it's the body surface area. In Stephen Johnson, the body surface area is less than 10%. In toxic epidermal necrolysis, it's more than 30%. And anything in between is an SJS, TN overlap. The most common etiology are drugs. We're gonna go through them now in a minute. And viruses more common in a pediatric group. So it's actually a type four hypersensitivity reaction. And as we said, medications are the most common culprits. You have antibiotics, anticonvulsants, allopurinol, NSAIDs, especially the, oxycam, uh, the oxycams, malignancies, infections. It's also been associated with antivirals and HIV. So what are the things that you look for? Skin lesions are accompanied by pain. So that's number one. Mucosal lesions are present, especially two. Oral mucosal is 90% and you have conjunctivitis as well. Uh, you can also have genital involvement. Why is this classified as a germ emergency? Because patients can die of the complications. You have respiratory compromise, DIC, dehydration, shock, infection, liver, renal, cardiac failure. Morbidity is very high, what we see now in this 410 system. So when you call the dermatologist to come to the ER and he does a biopsy for you, you're going to see that the outer skin layer and the inner skin layer have a blister. That means there is a split. There is necrosis of the outer skin layer. So here is a, a recap of what we just said. SJS is less than 10%, TN is more than 30%, and SJS-TN overlap is from 10 to 30%. What are the most common drugs? Most common drug class are sulfonamides. Dermatologists do not like Bactrim. Any sulfur-containing antibiotic or drug. In our patient, it was sulfasalazine. Other patients, it's sulfadiazine, sulfadioxone, coltrimoxazole, anticonvulsants such as carbamazepine, barbiturates, 
phenytoin, lamotrigine, and felbamine, antivirals, which is why it's also associated with HIV, nivirapine, and abacavir. Other antibiotics can still cause it. It's not just the sulfur-containing ones, such as cephalosporins, vancomycin, quinolones, doxy, erythromycin. Uric acid-lowering agents, allopurinol is quite common. Anti-TB agents, such as rifampin, isoniazin, ethambutol, and NSAIDs. The oxycam ones are high up there, but the other ones can cause it as well. This was an interesting study that I found in the Clinical Review of Allergy Immunology in 2018 that actually implicated that the, if the drug was started, there is a mean latency period of up to eight weeks. So from what I've seen in my practice, most of my patients uh, come to the ER within one to two weeks of starting the insidious drug, but it's good to keep that in mind. Okay, so what is the most important step for you as an ER physician or as a pediatric hospitalist to do? You need to stop the offending drug. So you're gonna tell me, I don't know which one it is. We usually actually stop most of the drugs that have been started the last two months. These patients need ICU admission. If you don't have a burn unit, admit to them to the ICU. Just tell the burn surgeons, do not debride the skin. They need supportive care, IV fluids, nutrition, Foley catheter if needed, but you have to be mindful not to injure the skin. Appropriate dressings, Vaseline impregnated gauze, Meplex border if you have it available in your institution. You have to consult the dermatology and which therapy are they gonna start? So before we go through the therapy, this is the SCORE 10 prognostic system. You don't really need to know this as someone who's a non-dermatologist, but it's good for you to have it in the back of your mind. These are seven points. Each one of these has one point. The mortality increases, the more points you have. The age more than 40, tachycardia more than 120, neoplasia, detachment of body surface area more than 10%, serum urea of more than 10, bicarb of less than 20, and blood glucose of more than 14. Okay, so in terms of therapy, the data is all over the map at the moment. Uh, initially in the 1990s and in the 2000s, steroids were formerly the mainstay of therapy, especially in North America. Now they seem to be falling out of favor. And why is that? Because we found that alone, they're not that great. There's a shift towards the use of IVIG in conjunction with steroids. This was prior, of course, to 2018, 2019. And it was found that high dose IVIG, closer to four milligrams, four grams per kilogram per day for four to five days showed better outcome and less mortality. And why does the IVIG work? So it actually inhibits something called a fast, fast ligand, which is one of the contributors for epidermal detachment. Okay, in 2008, France and Germany did another study. It was not a randomized control, but it was a retrospective study, and they showed that cyclosporin at three milligrams per kilogram per day was found to have rapid healing and decreased mortality. The issue with cyclosporin is it's contraindicated in renal disease. Mechanistically, of course, it makes a lot of sense. It stops the skin sloughing. It does immunosuppression. And this is what we did for our patient because she did not respond to IV methylprep. So in the, at the American Academy of Dermatology in 2018, a group from Taiwan presented data that showed favorable use of 50 milligrams once of itinericept, which is the tumor necrosis factor blocker. So you're gonna ask me, why didn't I use itinericept for our patient? So our patient did have a history of heart failure. And as you know, TNF blockers cannot be given in a heart failure patient, especially if they're class three or four. Their study initially showed better healing. So what is the best treatment? We don't have a best treatment at the moment. There is no randomized control data at this time that tells me that this is what I need to do. What I, I used the itinericept for another patient of ours who developed Stephen Johnson due to tazosin. He had a history of CLL, could not take cyclosporin due to renal toxicity, and did not respond to methylpred and IVIG. So we do have many treatment options out there. You, we do need definitely more collaborative trials to reach a consensus. Okay, the next emergency is the red man or erythroderma. This was another case from our practice, 56 year old male. He had a history of renal transplantation on CELSEP, PROGRAF and prednisone since 2018. He presented to the ER with these confluent erythematous plaques and patches all over the body. This is what he looked like. You can see the band-aid is where the biopsy was done. So this is also known as generalized exfoliative dermatitis. So what is it? It's an inflammatory dermatosis that involves more than 90% of the skin. There are four key points that you need to keep in mind. 
you have patchy erythematous plaques, and then they coalesce to become confluent and generalized within 48 hours. They're associated with a fever and malaise. The scaling typically ensues within two to six hours, and it's associated with dryness. The patient describes feeling tight and itchy. The scalp and body hair may be lost. The nails may become thickened or they may fall out. Okay, so this is not a diagnosis per se. We diagnose it by pathology because there are quite a few uh, inflammatory and neoplastic issues that can cause exfoliative dermatitis. Number one is eczema. Number two is psoriasis especially if the patient had been started on steroids, because steroid withdrawal may cause erythrodermic psoriasis. It also may cause posthumous psoriasis. Cesare syndrome, which is the leukemic phase of cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. Drug eruptions, same uh, category of drugs, antiepileptics, allopurinol, gold, sulfa, and antibiotics. Psoriasis rubricularis, and you have other rare dermatoses. So this is what it looks like on exam. As you can see, you have these generalized, well-defined, confluent erythematous patches and plaques. So the first patient was actually CTCL, which is Cesare syndrome or cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. The second patient is eczema. As you can see here, you cannot really differentiate clinically between them. That is where the dermatologist's role comes in and you need to do a biopsy. So how do you treat it? First, you have to treat the underlying cause. Why do we need to treat this immediately? Because it causes fluid loss, skin and respiratory uh, disturbance, electrolyte imbalance, heart failure, edema, hypothermia. So how are we gonna treat it? Number one, treat the underlying cause. Number two, the patient needs to be admitted. We need to start systemic steroids, topical creams such as emollients, steroids, maintenance of fluid and electrolyte balance, manage them if they have any sepsis with antibiotics, manage the cardiac failure with diuretics and beta blockers. The good thing about erythroderma is you have a good prognosis when it is due to an inflammatory cause. The increased mortality is when it is associated with an underlying malignancy such as CTCL. And you of course have to treat the underlying cause such as in psoriasis, crisis therapy is cyclosporin and you can treat with that. If they had severe eczema, you could also start cyclosporin or methylpret. So it really depends on the case that we have at hand. And that's where the dermatologist comes in. Thank you so much for listening. Are there any questions? Thank you, Dr. Afnan. This was very informative and very important. We do have a couple of questions. The first is how do you differentiate between SJS and DRESS? So uh, DRESS, uh, for, those of, uh, for those of us that do not know what it is, it's drug-induced hypersensitivity that also has elevated liver function, so transaminitis, elevated isonophils, and the TSH later on in the disease is also affected. In Stephen Johnson, these typically will not be affected. That's number one. Number two, blistering. So in Stephen Johnson, you have the blistering. In DRESS, you typically don't. Perfect. And what's the role of IVIG? Is it something that's routinely incorporated in SJS and 10? Uh, no, it's actually not routinely incorporated. In our hospital, at our institution, we are going towards using cyclosporin or itinericept uh, because we found that it's better for patients and the outcome is much better as well as the healing. In those that cannot take either, such as those with heart failure or renal disease, we give them the methylpred with the IVIG. It's a little bit slow. Perfect. Uh, one more question, if you'll allow us. Um, sure. Can you briefly mention the most important red flags to be on the lookout for? Uh, in terms of Stephen Johnson or in general? Generally, any red flag okay. emergencies. So number one, we have to look for mucosal sloughing. So involvement of the mucosa, skin sloughing, blisters that are starting to become confluent, generalized erythema, if there's involvement, of course, of the conjunctiva, if the patient has a high fever, hypotension, you feel like he's got, becoming acidotic with a skin rash, these are all red flags that you have to look for. Perfect. Thank you very much. This pretty much sums up our talk. If you have more questions and you have time in you, that would be great if you can answer them down in the question and answer box. Thank you sure, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is a consultant dermatologist currently working in at Habib Center, and she's a board certified dermatologist with an American board. Dr. Najud is going to talk about the most important pregnancy dermatosis you need to be in the lockout for. Dr. Najud, please, the floor is yours.
Thank you, Dr. Lemma. And before I start, I would like to thank the organizing committee and the Saudi Society of Dermatology Dermatologic Surgery for organizing this excellent event. Give me a few seconds while I share my uh, screen with you. So today I'm going to be discussing pregnancy dermatosis. I have no conflicts of interest to declare. Uh, the outline of my lecture, I'm going to start by speaking about the four uh, uh, the pruritic uh, pregnancy dermatosis that we are aware of. Uh, pregnancy um, dermatosis include uh, pentagogia gestationis, uh, polymorphic eruption of pregnancy, antihepatic cholestasis of pregnancy, and atopic eruption of pregnancy. I'm also going to be uh, talking about pustular psoriasis of pregnancy, uh, which uh, is uh, worth uh, mentioning because of the possible risk on the fetus. Uh, then I will uh, talk about some physiologic changes of pregnancy and special consideration of for corticosteroids and antihistamine use if the time um, allows. I'm going to start uh, by talking about uh, Pentagor gestationis. It's the um, rare pregnancy dermatosis. It's an autoimmune bullous disease involving immunoglobulin it's an uh, autoimmune bullous disease involving immunoglobin G1 uh, antibodies against uh, the 180 kilodalton transmembrane hemidisposomal protein, uh, also known as BP antigen uh, uh, 2 or collagen 17. Risk factors, uh, patients who are at risk for developing this dermatosis uh, are patients with HLA antigens DR3 and DR4. Uh, this, uh, this disease tends to occur at all stages of pregnancy, but it classically occurs during uh, late pregnancy as well as immediate postpartum period. Also, uh, women with uh, trophoblastic tumors such as hydatiform moles or uh, choriocarcinomas also have a risk of developing this entity. It's characterized by a sudden onset and a rapid progression. In addition to the uh, pruritus that the patients develop, they tend to also develop articular papules or plaques. They typically occur initially on the trunk, on the abdomen, uh, with predilection for the umbilicus. And then uh, these evolve to form grouped or herpetiform vesicles uh, and tense bully on an erythematous space. They can involve any part of the body uh, and only spare the mucous membranes. Uh, in this uh, uh, picture, you'll see the different stages and also different presentations of this condition. In uh, picture A, you'll see the articarial papules and plaques involving the abdomen uh, and uh, with paraumbilical predilection as seen in picture B. Uh, in uh, C, you see as the disease progresses, uh, there will be development of uh, some vesicles over the, uh, uh, the arithmetic space and tense bully as seen in uh, picture D. This disease, as I mentioned, can occur anywhere in the body uh, other than the mucous membranes, uh, such as the palms and soles as seen in picture F and G. Uh, this is another patient with pemphigor gestationis. Uh, just at a later stage of her uh, disease, you'll see some ruptured bully as well as post-inflammatory hyperpigmentary changes. In this picture, you'll see uh, most of the changes that occur in uh, pemphigor gestationis, articular plaques, uh, vesicles, uh, tense bully, as well as some ruptured bully as well. Uh, this uh, patient, uh, is, this is the same patient showing different stages of development of the disease with some post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation on the upper thighs. Uh, this is actually a postpartum female. Uh, as you can see, some uh, grouped or herpetiform vesicles seen on the lower right abdomen, a tense uh, bully seen on the linea nigra, uh, and uh, involvement of the umbilicus is clear. Uh, this disease tends to improve uh, through, uh, as the disease progresses. However, 75 patient of patients will have a flare during uh, the time of delivery, and this can be explosive within hours. Uh, it is a self-limited disease, so once uh, the, the patient delivers, there should be a spontaneous um, remission within weeks or months. However, there have been some reported cases of protracted cases that do not uh, remit. It does not uh, necessarily occur at the patient's, uh, patient's first pregnancy, but once it occurs, it tends to recur in subsequent pregnancies. And uh, the uh, subsequent pregnancy usually, uh, pregnancies usually have a more uh, rapid onset and a more severe course of disease. It's important also to educate the patient about the possibility of skip pregnancies that, that can occur up to 8% of women. Uh, flares with menstruations and the use of OCPs can happen in about 25 to 50% of cases. 
Uh, fetal risk is present with pemphigoid gestationis, um, and it's the only uh, pregnancy dermatosis that can affect the fetus directly. About 10% of newborn babies can have uh, lesions uh, when they are born, but it's usually uh, mild and can spontaneously re resolve within days to weeks after delivery. This is due to the transfer of uh, maternal, passive transfer of maternal uh, antibodies from the mom to the fetus during a pregnancy. Uh, other fetal risks include, include uh, uh, chronic placental insufficiency, prematurity, and small for gestational age neonates. Maternal risk, there is no direct maternal risk. However, uh, patients with pemphigoid gestation, gestationis, they have a slightly increased risk of development of Graves' disease. Uh, regarding investigations, uh, when, sus when suspected, uh, biopsy is warranted in pemphigoid gestationis. We usually do a biopsy of the lesional skin as well as the IF of the perilegional skin. And uh, the perilegional skin, uh, the DIF of the perilegional skin usually should be uh, placed in the Michelle's medium. Uh, but if you are expecting the, the biopsy to be processed within 24 hours, then you can place it in normal saline. Uh, the biopsy um, might show a subepidermal blister. However, eosinophils are the usual um, most uh, common or most consistent uh, finding in the biopsy. Uh, regarding the DIF, uh, you'll see linear C3 um, along the basement, um, basal mas basement membrane zone of perilegional skin in 100% of patients, and linear IgG can be seen in 30% of patients. Um, antibody titers uh, of the uh, non-collagenous um, domain of the BP180 uh, through ELISA can also be done, and this is usually done to monitor the treatment and to assess the severity of the disease. Uh, regarding the treatment, uh, patients can be controlled by using topical uh, corticosteroids, uh, emollients, and systemic antihistamines. However, corticosteroids for pemphigoid gestation is, is the mainstay of treatment. Uh, the dose is uh, 0.5 milligram per kilogram of prednisolone daily until the disease starts to improve. Uh, however, when patients start to flare during uh, the end of the uh, pregnancy, we tend to increase the dose again and can reach up to two milligrams per kilograms of prednisolone. Uh, this is the um, preferred uh, steroid because it tends to have a rapid uh, breakdown in the placenta, so only a minimal amount will arrive, uh, will reach the uh, fetal circulation. Patients who do not respond to topical, to systemic or topical corticosteroids can benefit from plasmapheresis. So uh, my second topic uh, today is uh, polymorphic eruption of pregnancy, uh, previously known as uh, PUP or Brutic articarial papules and plaques of pregnancy. It's a common pregnancy dermatosis. It is not an autoimmune diathesis and is not associated with any HLA type, unlike just uh, pemphigoid gestationis. Risk factors include primary paris women during uh, their first pregnancy, can also occur in uh, patients with uh, increased maternal weight gain or multiple gestations. Um, the reason for that is that uh, stretching of the uh, skin during uh, in, with increased maternal weight gain or with multiple gestation can result in damage to the connective tissue, which might uh, cause a, an allergic response uh, towards that, uh, connective, that damaged connective tissue. That later on will cause the cross-reactivity with otherwise normal connective tissue of the rest of the body, which results in the spread of the, uh, of the rash into the, the, the rest of the body. Uh, presentation, uh, this is another one that presents uh, mostly during the third uh, trimester, uh, late th third trimester, about 85% of cases, 15% of cases present during the postpartum period. It's uh, in addition to pruritus, uh, also it's characterized by erythematous edematous papules and plaques. Uh, they uh, tend to follow the stria of the abdomen and uh, tend to have periumbilical sparing, uh, which uh, disting uh, distinguishes uh, this condition from uh, pemphigoid gestationis. Uh, it tends to spread over days. It spares the face and palms and soles, unlike pemphigoid gestationis, which can involve these areas as well. Uh, from the name, um, we, can, uh, this, uh, we can tell that this condition is polymorphic. So in addition to the typical uh, papules and plaques, they can present with different uh, lesions, such as targetoid lesions, vesicular lesions, or even eczematous lesions. So this is a patient with a typical presentation of uh, a polymorphic eruption of pregnancy. You can see that the erythematous papules and plaques follow this, the lines of the stria and has a typical periumbilical sparing. Uh, the, this patient also has involvement of the forearms as well as the anterior upper thighs. Uh, after one week of treatment with topical steroids, uh, you can see an improvement of the rash with uh, some uh, uh, post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. 
Um, uh, as I mentioned, uh, since it's called polymorphic, there would be other uh, um, signs of or other lesions that can develop in this condition, such as targetoid lesions or vesicular lesions. Um, it's a self-limited condition. It, it tends to resolve over four to six weeks, uh, regardless of the time of onset, and uh, unusual to recur in subsequent pregnancies unless it's a, a multiple gestation pregnancy. Fetal risk and maternal risk is absent in uh, this condition. And uh, we usually, uh, the diagnosis is based on uh, clinical history and presentation. No biopsy is needed, and usually the biopsy and DIF are non-specific. Labs are not needed. Treatment, some patients, some minority of patients can be treated conservatively, uh, but uh, if they are uh, complaining of uh, pruritus or are bothered by the rash, we can do topical steroids or antihistamines. And in some cases who do not respond, can, uh, we can use a short course of oral steroids that, uh, that can be tapered over a period of two weeks. And uh, I'll move on to intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy. Uh, it's a rare uh, dermatosis or pregnancy, but it's worth mentioning because of the significant fetal risk associated. It's characterized by reduced excretion of bile acids, resulting in an increased serum level of bile acids. Um, and the risk factors include genetic predisposition. 50% of patients show family history of uh, this condition. Uh, multiple gestation, possibly due to the, uh, to the cholestatic effects of pregnancy hormones. And hepatitis C, as in uh, one study has shown that 20% of patients who had hepatitis C went on to develop ICP during their pregnancies. Others include selenium deficiency and increased intestinal permeability. Um, it tends to occur late during pregnancy, similar to the uh, other uh, conditions that I've mentioned. It has a sudden onset and characterized by intense generalized pruritus. This pruritus tends to start on, at the uh, palms and soles and tends to worsen at night. Uh, this is the only pregnancy dermatosis that does not have any primary lesions. Um, and secondary lesions can occur over time uh, with the prolonged course of the disease. They can uh, be from excorations to paragonodularis, depending on how uh, prolonged the course is. Most severe areas involved include the surfaces, uh, the extensive surfaces of the extremities, the buttocks and the abdomen, usually areas that the patient can reach and scratch. Again, with prolonged uh, courses of disease, of this disease, uh, jaundice can develop. This can occur in about 10% of patients, and those patients can develop steatorrhea or hemorrhage. Uh, this patient um, um, has some uh, secondary changes. Uh, arrow A points uh, towards linear excorations, and arrow B uh, points at uh, some excorated papules. Um, again, uh, some linear excorations, which are uh, secondary um, changes. Uh, this patient with ICP has excreted papules and nodules over the buttocks and the back. As you can see, most of these lesions are concentrated on areas that the patient can reach, while the mid-back, uh, uh, less likely, uh, the patient is less likely to be able to reach that and scratch, so it's, it has less uh, lesions. Uh, again, uh, the extensive surfaces of the extremities are the ones that are most severely uh, affected. Um, it, uh, the pruritus persists until delivery, but uh, once, uh, once the patient de uh, delivers, it resolves spontaneously. Uh, a protracted course in, as unusual, if that happens, then we have to think about other primary liver uh, diseases, uh, such as uh, primary biliary cirrhosis, and recurrences are common with subsequent pregnancies and OCPUs. Uh, fetal risk is significant with this condition. Um, and that it's caused by toxic bile acids crossing the placenta. This can result in abnormal uterine contractility and vasoconstriction of chorionic veins. Um, such risks are premature births, up to 60% of cases, intrapartum fetal distress, up to 30% of cases, uh, meconium uh, staining of amniotic fluid. Abnormal fetal heart rate can occur uh, because of the impaired cardiomyocyte function of the fetal myocytes. Um, and that results in uh, tachycardia or um, arrhythmias. Acute fetal anoxia, anox fetal anoxia can occur and fetal uh, loss can occur in one to two cases, one to two percent of cases. Um, this uh, risk uh, is higher with the higher um, bile acid levels. So usually levels that are higher than 40 uh, micromoles per liter and uh, stillbirths are associated with levels higher than 100 micromoles per liter. Maternal risk, uh, in minority of cases that develop with prolonged disease, extrahepatic uh, cholestasis, these can develop steatorrhea, uh, vitamin K deficiency that can result or, uh, in intra uh, or postpartum hemorrhages. 
Uh, regarding the investigation of this condition, we do it by clinical presentation, abnormal laboratory investigations. Uh, biopsy and AIF are usually not helpful in diagnosis. Uh, the most important uh, lab test to be uh, measured is the to total serum bile acid level. Uh, this tends to be elevated in pregnant uh, females and the higher levels of about uh, six micromoles per liter, but in and uh, in this condition, we expect it to be higher than 100, than uh, 11 micromoles per liter um, in pregnant women. Um, uh, also, elevated serum amino transferases can occur, uh, but can be normal in 30% of cases. ALP and GTT uh, can be elevated as well, uh, but not, are not as helpful. Um, elevated dark bilirubin and increased PT can occur in patients who develop jaundice and, um, and vitamin K deficiency. Hepatic ultrasound is usually a normal unless the patient developed jaundice and has a higher risk of gallstones, then we might see gallstones on the hepatic ultrasound. Uh, viral hepatitis, uh, we do that case on uh, by case basis if the patient shows risk factors for hepatitis C uh, development. Uh, regarding the uh, treatment, uh, ursodioxycholic acid uh, is the mainstay of treatment, about 15 milligram per kilogram daily or one gram daily in divided doses. Uh, we, uh, we can go up to 21 milligrams per kilogram daily, depending on the improvement of the patient or the response of the patient. Uh, PT monitoring and vitamin K replacement is recommended in jaundice patients, and uh, close PT monitoring is important as well. Um, my uh, next topic is a topic eruption of pregnancy. Um, most common uh, pretty, uh, pretty disorder of pregnancy in uh, most patients, it's the first time, um, uh, first occurrence, uh, but most of these patients also tend to have some family history of or history of atopy. Uh, and 20% of patients, uh, they have uh, an exacerbation of a pre-existing uh, known atopic dermatitis. Um, it's the only uh, pregnancy dermatosis that is, uh, is uh, characteristically, characteristically um, uh, usually, uh, presents uh, early in pregnancy, 75% uh, before the third trimester, but typically during the first trimester. Uh, most of the patients, they have a typical eczematous uh, presentation, eczematous lesions on the face, neck, and flexural areas, which we call the atopic areas. And one third will show papular uh, presentation with uh, pap papular lesions or parietal lesions on trunk and extremities. Uh, most patients will also show signs of xerosis or other atopic signs as well. Uh, so this is patient with atopic uh, dermatitis. You can uh, see on the antiquipital fossa obvious signs of xerosis and lichenification. We can see the accentuation of the skin lines as well as uh, many ex excurated uh, erythematous papules. Uh, similar findings in this patient, uh, patient on the neck. And uh, this patient as well has similar findings along with uh, some erythematous papules and plaques on the forearm and upper arm. Uh, this this uh, entity responds well to topical therapy and tends to resolve uh, after delivery, uh, but also tends to recur in subsequent pregnancies. Uh, the fetal risk and maternal risk uh, are absent. And uh, regarding the investigation, uh, it's made by clinical presentation and the presence of atopic history. Uh, the uh, biopsy is usually not needed, but it's variable depending on the stage of the lesion, and uh, DIF and IF are negative. And 70% of patients might show elevated uh, serum IgG, IgE level, uh, but this, uh, this is usually just a mild elevation. Uh, for treatment, just uh, such a, similar to atopic dermatitis, patients will respond well to topical steroids and antihistamines, and uh, as well as other treatments such as moisturizers, or antibiotic agents. Um, and, but in patients who are uh, not responsive to topical steroids, UVB has been used with success. If we uh, see any secondary bacterial infection, we can uh, treat the patient with antibiotics. Uh, this, uh, this table is to summarize these four uh, dermatoses of pregnancy, pruritic dermatoses of pregnancy. Uh, PG and IC ICP are rare, but we mentioned them because of the significant fetal risk. Uh, PEP and atopic eruption of pregnancy are, are common. Uh, the onset, uh, they most, uh, mostly they appear within the late pregnancy except for atopic eruption of pregnancy, which is the one that occurs early during pregnancy. Uh, but it's important to notice, uh, to mention that uh, PG can also occur early, but tends to occur more uh, classically during late gestation. Uh, for presentation, uh, the points to remember for PG is that it starts on the abdomen and it tends to, uh, to be concentrated on the umbilical area. And it's the only one that presents with the tense bully uh, it spares the mucous membranes. 
uh, for uh, PEP, uh, it uh, tends to follow the stria of the abdomen uh, and tends to have peri-umbilical sparing and sparing of the palms and soles and face. Uh, for ICP, it's the only one that does not have any primary lesions and mainly presents with uh, significant pruritus that starts on the palms and soles uh, and is worse at night. And for a topic eruption of pregnancy, most patients do develop uh, the, uh, the, ex uh, the typical eczematous lesions. Uh, for uh, the, regarding the course of the, the disease, uh, they all uh, tend, they all tend to resolve with delivery. Uh, PG tend to flare around the time of uh, of, uh, of delivery, uh, and uh, PEP usually resolves within four to eight to six weeks. Um, ICP does need treatment uh, for uh, for to reduce the maternal symptoms as well as to reduce the fetal risk associated with this condition. Um, for a topic eruption of pregnancy, it does respond well to topical treatment. Uh, PG, ICP, and atopic eruption pregnancy all can recur during subsequent pregnancies, while PEP only recurs in, in, in cases of multiple gestation. Uh, uh, PG and ICP tend to recur with uh, OCPUs as well. Um, fetal risk, uh, as I mentioned, PG and ICP are the ones with the significant fetal risk, and the fetus needs to be monitored and the treatment has to be started uh, to improve that risk. I will not go over the diagnosis and management uh, summary uh, because of the, for the sake of time. Uh, I want to go through postural psoriasis of pregnancy because uh, it is also one of the conditions that can be associated, associated with significant fetal risk. Uh, it's a form of severe postular psoriasis during pregnancy. Uh, it can occur at any stage, however, similar to the other pregnancy dermatosis, it tends to occur more towards the late uh, third trimester. Uh, the, these patients do not have the pruritus associated with other dermatoses, but they do tend to have some systemic symptoms such as fever or malaise. Uh, the skin presentation is uh, usually with uh, pustules and uh, group pustules or uh, lakes of pus on an erythematous base, usually in a circinate or a ring pattern over, um, over areas of the body, um, starting with the groin, axilla, and neck, and can spread into other areas of the body as well. It requires treatment during uh, it requires treatment during pregnancy, but does resolve with delivery and can recur with subsequent pregnancy. Uh, fetal risk uh, can uh, it, the the baby can develop placental insufficiency and can which can end in fetal death. Uh, maternal risk: some patients can develop hypocalcemia because of parathyroid dysfunction. And uh, for for diagnosis of this condition, we depend on uh, clinical diagnosis as well as biopsy and some lab investigations, including a CBC, metabolic profile, renal and liver function test. We might do a swab and culture of the pustule to roll out a uh, bacterial cause or a fungal cause for the, for the pustules. Uh, the biopsy shows the typical finding of pustular psoriasis and the pustules are usually sterile in this entity. Uh, patients usually show also leukocytosis and an elevated ASR level. They might have show hypocalcemia, as I mentioned, but this usually resolves with delivery. Uh, other uh, signs or, or other lab and, and abnormalities include hypoalbuminemia, albinuria, pyuria, or hematuria. Uh, they are treated with uh, systemic steroids up to 80 milligrams a day of prednisolone, and this is tapered based on the response of the patient. This is a pregnant patient with postular psoriasis. As you can see, uh, the, the ring pattern or the circinate pattern of the, uh, of the uh, lesions uh, with uh, pustules and our legs and legs of pus on erythematous space. And these are some more close, uh, some close up uh, images of, uh, of the lesions. Um, I will uh, mention some uh, special consideration for steroids and antihistamine use uh, in, uh, in pregnancy. For topical uh, steroids, uh, systemic uh, absorption can occur. Uh, Long-term use uh, might result in, in changes such as dispigmentation, stria, and skin atrophy. So it's important to educate the patient about these possible side effects that can, can occur with uh, long-term use. In education, the patient, we usually follow uh, the fingertip unit uh, rule, which is uh, the fingertip unit is the area from the tip of the finger up to the most distal uh, finger crease. And uh, this usually is enough to cover two um, the flats of two palms put together on the patient. Um, so this is a way to tell the patients how, how much uh, uh, topical steroid to, each to, uh, to use to cover 
an area of, of the body. And that can help us also calculate how much steroid we need to prescribe for the patient because each uh, fingertip unit is, uh, is about 0.5 grams of topical steroid. Halogenated steroids are the, um, uh, the, uh, the more stronger steroids, but they, they, too, they have a better effect and they are more helpful for patients, but they do tend to cross the placenta and have a higher risk of side effects. Class six and seven uh, steroids are the safest, but they not, they're not as effective. When we uh, choose the topical steroid, we uh, tend to avoid uh, stronger steroids around the areas of the face or flexural areas because the skin is, tends to be thinner and uh, higher risk, as a, at a higher risk of uh, side effects. Uh, but uh, depend, it all depends on the clinical presentation of the patients and their symptoms. Uh, for systemic steroids, also important to notify the patient about the possible uh, risk for cliff pellet and uh, cliff lip, lip and pellet in the first trimester. Uh, but this is, as uh, we know, is uh, one of the debated risks, as well as risk of insufficiency with long-term use. Uh, for antihistamines, uh, in the first trimester, uh, the safest are sedating antihistamines such as chlorpheniramine. And in the second trimester, if the patient requests uh, non-sedating antihistamines, loratadine and cetirizine are uh, safer options. Um, I can uh, go through some of the uh, physiologic changes in pregnancy. Um, uh, these include pigmentation. Uh, as we know, a lot of changes can happen in the pregnancy and they're considered normal, but some of them um, can persist after pregnancy and it's important to uh, tell the patient about those as well. Uh, for pigmentation, uh, pigmentation of the areola can happen, the knee nigra, which is the linear, the, uh, linear pigmented line and the middle of the abdomen. Uh, common in, in, in most pregnant uh, females. Uh, melasma can occur due to hormonal changes in pregnancy. And this is one of the conditions that tend to <clears throat> uh, persist after uh, delivery and tend to recur with subsequent pregnancies. Uh, also important to mention that uh, the nevi of uh, patients might darken in color or might enlarge in, in, in size uh, during pregnancy, uh, but it's, uh, these, this, these changes are usually symmetrical, so it's important to educate the patient uh, about the signs to look for um, in, 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 and watch for the nevi and look for any asymmetric changes. Uh, for uh, regarding hirsutism, uh, regarding hair, some of the changes include hirsutism, postpartum telogen effluvium, and postpartum and androgenic alopecia. Hirsutism tends to uh, resolve uh, after delivery. For postpartum telogen effluvium, it tends to be more of a delayed onset, uh, but can uh, improve uh, with time, usually over a period of months. And uh, regarding the postpartum androgenic alopecia, uh, this usually tends to, uh, uh, this, this might persist after delivery. Uh, nail changes includes hyperkeratosis, onycholysis, transverse grooves, and brittleness. Uh, regarding land function, uh, uh, note, we noticed that there is increased eccrine function and sebaceous function while there is a decreased epocrine function. Um, patients, as you know, preg pregnant patients uh, have a higher risk for developing stria. These depend on different environmental and hormonal factors, uh, as well as genetic factors. Uh, there are various uh, vascular uh, uh, changes that can occur from uh, spider angiomas to pyogenic granulomas to hemorrhoids. Um, and that's, so that concludes my lecture. Thank you so much. And thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Anjoud. Very informative lecture. We do have a couple of questions on us. The first one is, um, you did mention that steroids are safe to, be, safe to be used during pregnancy, but for how long can you use them, like the duration? So usually we use the uh, topicals for topical stories, we have to use them until the symptoms resolve. However, we tend to educate the patients about uh, how to take breaks after each two weeks of use. So we tend to ask the patient to use them for two weeks and then take a break of one to two weeks, uh, depending on how often they flare. If the patients uh, tend to flare more frequently, uh, then we can ask them to use a maintenance dose of uh, one to two times uh, a week just to keep the disease under control. And the regarding application is usually applied uh, twice a day. Perfect, thank you. One more question to go. Um, mm -hmm. If a pregnant woman develops acne, are there any safe therapeutic options we can offer? Uh, yes, uh, there are uh, certain uh, medications, topical medications that can be used, such as azelaic acid uh, or certain, uh, certain antibiotics, topical antibiotics that can be used as well, um, uh, such as erythromycin or, um, and, uh, but of course we tend to avoid um, uh, tetracyclines, which are commonly used during uh, in non-pregnant females, isotretinoin definitely not a, a good option in pregnant females because of the risk on the fetus. 
Perfect. Thank you very much, Victoria, for this very informative talk. Thank you. I appreciate it. Dear guests, this concludes our first session. Uh, we'll return back after the break with more interesting topics. Before we go, just a couple of more instructions to go. If you still have an, a question that's not answered, feel free to write it down in the question and answer box. And some of the doctors, if they have time. Also, if you know a colleague who had, did not have an opportunity to join the, the Zoom room, feel free to tell them to go into our Twitter account and join the link over there. They can register and get their CME hours if they need to. Thank you very much. We'll see you after the break. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Hello, everyone. And we are back for our fourth and last session in the course. Uh, my name is Dr. Lai Salah, and I am a member of the organizing committee, and I am happy to introduce my friend, uh, Dr. Saad al uh, the uh, He is an associate professor and consultant in hematology at the Imam University. He will be talking about pigmentation in skin of, all, of color, our skin type. Uh, hello, Dr. Saad, and I'll leave the mic to you. Hello, Dr. Luay. I would like, uh, first of all, to thank Dr. Luay and the organizing committee and the Saudi Society for the Ontology for this amazing and unique uh, symposium. So uh, here we go now. We'll talk about common pigmentary disorders in dermatology, and we'll concentrate, as mentioned by Dr. Luay, in our skin type. So uh, this topic actually is very important. So uh, as, as a dermatologist, we are facing uh, many complaints from the patients about um, the skin um, uh, pigmentations issue, especially hyperpigmentation. Uh, because of that, we are thinking that uh, any, uh, I mean, uh, practitioner, either dermatologist or non-dermatologist should know at least the basics about uh, this issue. So uh, starting with the background, which is common in, in, uh, in all, uh, uh, I mean, in medical school, uh, as we remember, but just a quick reminder, we have the epidermis, dermis, and subcutaneous tissue. These are the main layers of uh, skin. Our uh, now concentration will be in the, in the epidermis, where we have the uh, melanocytes. So each melanocytes, as we can see here, it's connected to different keratinocytes. It's from 30 to 40 um, uh, neighboring uh, keratinocytes. And because of that, the number of melanocytes is much, much, much uh, less than uh, uh, keratinocytes. Any uh, uh, effect on these melanocytes will affect the pigmentation, which will appear clinically, either hyperpigmentation or hypopigmentation. So let's go now for important term terminology. If you are talking about pigmentary uh, disorder of uh, uh, skin, you will talk uh, either hype about hyperpigmentation, hypopigmentation, depigmentation, and dispigmentation. So let's take them one by one. So hyperpigmentation, as the name implies, hyper, that's mean more pigmentation. Hypopigmentation, that's mean less pigmentation. Depigmentation, that's mean complete loss of uh, the pigmentation, which is uh, commonly we see it in patients with uh, vitiligo. Dispigmentation, uh, it means mixture of hyperpigmentation, hypo slash depigmentation. So these terminology are very important, especially if you are describing this to, um, uh, I mean, um, a dermatologist, this will give him some idea about what you are uh, describing. So also this is a very important tool. If you can see here uh, in the top, we can see patient of vitiligo uh, in the face and in the foot. And you can see after applying Wood's lamp, which is um, uh, 365 nanometer, this will reflect, uh, if it is depigmented, it will be very white, uh, chalky white. And this is very important to differentiate it from uh, other diseases. Also, we can use it sometimes in uh, petrius vers versicolor, and it will appear clinically as golden yellow. Here, it's not that clear but clinically you will see it uh, clear and sometimes you have to give it some time. So uh, you just apply um, uh, this tool and you switch off the light, you will see uh, these different uh, colors. 
Also, we have in this lecture unique modalities of treatment. So um, as we know that um, uh, some of the, I mean, each specialty, they have their own unique modalities of treatment. And this, this is very important to know in this, uh, specifically in this topic, starting with uh, one in the left side, this is, we call it narrow band UVB. And in the right side, this is called eczema laser. So both are having ultraviolet B and uh, it works through immunomodulation and enhance uh, melanocyte uh, proliferation and can, uh, I mean, commonly used in vitiligo. The difference here is simple. This is for generalized, so the patient will get in and will close the cabinet. Here, it's just like laser, as, as uh, uh, its name uh, tell. It's a laser, so it can be used over localized uh, area. So if you have patient with localized area you want to treat, you will send them to the laser. If, if it is generalized, you will send them for uh, narrow band UVB. Now let's go for the approach. If you have patient with pigmentary, uh, uh, I mean complain, and you are non-dermatologist, how you approach this patient? Starting with asking your, yourself, is this hyperpigmentation or a high poo pigmentation? So now we'll talk about high poo pigmentation, then we'll talk about hyperpigmentation in details. So hypopigmentation will be subcategorized. It's either uh, high po real hypopigmentation or depigmentation. So you will use the Woods lamp that we mentioned before, and uh, this will give you an idea, is this depigmentation or hypopigmentation? And based on that, you will go for different uh, differential diagnosis that we will talk about it, uh, inshallah, in a few slides. Okay. So starting with vitiligo, it's the most common acquired hypopigmentary disorder affecting 0 0.5 to 1% of the population worldwide. Although we think that it's more in our society, there is no, uh, up to my knowledge, any statistics regarding this, but because of the consanguinity that it's common in, in, in our culture, I think it will be more, uh, as we know that vitiligo is having genetic background. Also, different modalities of treatment can be used depending on the activity of the disease, body surface area, and age of the patient. So if the patient is having active disease, most likely you will go uh, towards something that it will cover the whole body. It's either uh, narrow band UVB or give him sometimes, which is rarely we use systemic steroid. If the patient is having over small area, body surface area, we will send him for eczema laser and topical treatment. And if the patient is a child, we will not send him for uh, narrow band, not because of uh, the safety of ultraviolet, but because of safety of closing this cabinet on the child. Sometimes it's difficult to uh, adapt with this. So what's the clinical presentation of vitiligo? Vitiligo is a very common disorder. So um, it can present at any age, can be congenital, even congenital or an elder patient. Also, it can be hypo and hyperpigmented. As we, this presentation, we all know it from medical school, it's a uh, depigmentation. But sometimes if it is early, um, uh, in early stage, you can see some high poor pigmentation. And based on that, you can uh, uh, diagnose patient with query or early vitiligo if there is highly, uh, I mean, if, if the, the situation is highly suspicious, especially if the patient is having family history or pe uh, previous uh, personal history of vitiligo or other autoimmune disease. So treatment, it depends on the distribution and activity. If it is localized, we'll go with something local, like topical treatment. Uh, and usually we use weekends and weekdays uh, wait. So if, uh, if you want to use topical steroid and topical tacrolimus, which is immunomodulator, we use tacrolimus in the weekdays because it's uh, uh, more safe and less side effects. And in the weekends, we can use uh, topical steroid to minimize the side effect and increase the um, uh, efficacy of uh, this uh, important treatment. Also, eczema laser can be used, and this will help, uh, especially if the patient is um, uh, having a um, uh, small area and uh, in the face, usually they respond uh, very quickly. If it is generalized, as we mentioned, narrow band UVB, it's very important uh, modality and can be used, uh, especially if the patient is having um, active disease. Uh, extensive sometimes will go with depigmentation. So depigmentation is a very important issue. The patient is more than 50% of his body surface area, and the patient is not responding to any medical or phototherapy treatment. 
we may go for depigmentation, but it's very important to know that depigmentation is usually done almost exclusively by creams, what we call it um, uh, Benequin, it's well known as Benequin. So Benequin, it can be used uh, uh, in 20%, 30%, and 40% concentration. Sometimes, rarely, we use lasers to remove the rest of the pigmentation, uh, I mean normal pigmentation, if the patient is having only localized area. But the, 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 the main, uh, uh, let's say, modality of uh, depigmentation is creams. And we are facing many, many patients asking for injections, asking for tablets, capsules, for depigmentation. There is uh, nothing safe and effective other than uh, the cream. And this is very important to educate your patients. Let's go for Petriasis alba. Petriasis alba, it's commonly as, as you can see here, uh, in the photo, the patient is usually dark skin, child, and he's having few hypopigmented. You can see there is no depigmentation. It's a little bit hypopigmented. Um, uh, and usually they have a history of um, uh, atopy. So either bronchial asthma, atopic dermatitis, and so on. The treatment is simply moisturizers. Sometimes we advise for sunscreen. So we decrease the contrast bec between normal and abnormal skin plus minus topical steroid or tacrolimus if there is itching or edema. So mainly it's reassurance, sunscreen and moisturizers, not, nothing else. What about if you have now a child with hypopigmentation? Sometimes you get confused, this is especially for pediatricians. If you have patient with hypopigmentation, it can be mainly one of the four. One of them is vitiligo, as we mentioned before. The second is uh, if the patient is having family history or personal history of atopy and it's a scaly in the face, we will think about um, uh, betriasis alba, as we mentioned. Also, if the um, uh, patient is, have, is having this since paired with a regular border and stable for many years, this is what we call nevus depigmentosis. So it's simply nevus. There is no effective treatment and it's, it will never grow. Okay, so let's go now for the third one, which is vitiligo, as we know, what we call it segmental vitiligo. It's usually respecting the midline. You can see here the midline of the face. It will never uh, uh, cross the midline. And you can see a lot of what we call it leukotrichia, which is white hair. So this is, will give you indication of segmental vitiligo. What about post-inflammatory hypopigmentation? And this is very important also for pediatrician. If you have patient um, that is having like chronic uh, atopic dermatitis and after treatment, he end up with this. This is very common. We see it in pediatric population. It can be result from cutaneous inflammation like eczema, injury or dermatological treatment like cryotherapy. And this is very important for uh, a family physician who's treating patients like, for example, uh, warts with cryotherapy. You should be gentle not to induce um, uh, hypopigmentation. Usually, usually this hypopigmentation improves spontaneously with time whenever you remove the cause. But sometimes uh, I have seen it, it become permanent, unfortunately, especially if it is uh, from external injury like cryotherapy. What about petriasis versicolor? We have here, uh, usually the patient will present either with hypo, as we can see, or hyper slash inflammatory lesions, especially in the upper trunk and sometimes neck and uh, uh, proximal uh, upper extremities. The treatment is antifungal. We give either topical antifungal or oral antifungal, and we wait for the color to uh, improve. So if, the, if you give, for example, this patient treatment, and he improved regarding itching, regarding scaling, regarding erythema, but the color itself, the contrast, will take a long time until it improves. If you are seeing any patient with hypopigmentation, please don't miss hypopigmented MF, which is hypopigmented mycosis fungoides or T-cell lymphoma. This is very important not to miss, especially if you have patient in the hidden area and you can see here it's hypopigmented, not depigmented. You have to send for a dermatologist to rule out um, uh, lymphoma. Now we'll come for hyperpigmentation. As we uh, finish from hypopigmentation, now for hyperpigmentation, it's either uh, localized or generalized. We'll talk about the most important uh, we are seeing in the clinics. So starting with prickles. 
uh, or they call it in Arabic, uh, nemesh. So freckles is a small, well-circumscribed pigmented macules found only in, on sun-exposed skin and individuals with fair skin. So it's very common in fair skin people. And uh, I'm, I'm sure that you have seen this even in the community or um, uh, in your families. So usually the treatment as the patient is having genetic predisposition for this, you have to tell your patient that uh, even if you improve sometimes or most of the time you will have recurrence, especially if they are exposed to, sun, uh, to the sun uh, regularly. So we have to use, to ask the patient to use sunscreen regularly and they can uh, use retinoids and hydroquinone with uh, steroid, what we call it, ligament formula. Uh, also, sometimes we use light cryotherapy. Sometimes we use it with the cotton tip. Uh, also laser, it's very effective, but uh, also the uh, relapse is uh, very common with that. What about lentigens? Lentigens is more or less uh, have sharing some features of freckles. So it's tan to brown black macules inside exposure to ultraviolet um, uh, radiation. And the treatment also sunscreen is very important. Cryotherapy, laser may work, but the topical treatment usually does, doesn't, I mean, improve these uh, lesions. So the triple formula usually doesn't work with uh, such patients. This table is summarizing the differences between um, epilids or freckles and solar lentigens. And we can see here, Usually, lentigens is larger than uh, uh, freckles, and also in the freckles, usually it's, it be, I mean, it become uh, evident early in age, and this one late in age. And we can see the lentigens clearly in elderly patients in our community. What about hyperpigmentation? You have, you, you don't, you, you, I mean, it's very important not to miss acral melanoma. If you have any patient with pigmentation in the nail especially if it is crossing to the nail fold, you have to act immediately and repair the patient to either dermatology or plastic surgery surface. So most of the time the patient is having uh, acral melanoma. Rarely what we, what we call it, um, uh, this, this sign we call it Hutchinson sign, sometimes pseudo Hutchinson sign, but uh, anyway, you have to refer for a uh, dermatologist or a plastic surgeon to act um, fastly for such patients. What about melasma? It uh, presents as a bilateral blotchy brownish facial pigmentation. It's more common in, in women. And the cause is, is complex, sun, genetics, and hormones. So the sun exposure is very important any, for any hyperpigmentation. Sun exposure, as, as you can see, it's crucial for freckles, lentigens, and now for uh, melasma. Also genetic predisposition is more in uh, darker, um, uh, I mean, um, uh, patients with darker skin, like in Middle East, uh, India, and so on. And also hormonal changes, like uh, pregnancy and oral cont contraceptive pills may uh, contribute to the uh, pigmentation. So the main issue with treatment of melasma is relapse. So whenever you treat the patient, usually they relapse uh, because they have genetic predisposition, usually they exposed to the sun. So they, they, they have it more and more. We have to stop the cause, which is sun exposure or using sunscreen. Plus if the patient is, is using uh, oral contraceptive pills, they have to stop it. Uh, and change the modality for uh, non-hormonal uh, modality. The most successful formulation has been a combination of hydroquinone, tretinoin, and topical steroid, what we call it Kligman formula. Uh, it's very common. Um, and there is one um, cream that is very famous in Saudi Arabia, which is Triloma from Galderma. It is one of the uh, oldest one that used in Saudi Arabia. Unfortunately, it's not. I, I don't think it's available in most of the uh, I mean, private section, but I think it's available in the governmental section. Uh, it's very good, but it's very important to know that it should be used carefully. Um, just use a uh, uh, small amount and not to be used more than six months because uh, there are some co rare complications uh, of using hydroquinone for a long time, and it may uh, lead to uh, very dark and severe pigmentation. Also peeling, sometimes if the patient is uh, I mean, in hurry or they want to improve quickly, 
we can give them a chance uh, to try uh, peeling in the clinic and give the patient maintenance at home. Lasers also can be used. Uh, the main issue with laser, it's very expensive and the recurrence is very high, as you mentioned. So it's not a good option, to be honest. I rarely use, and I don't recommend to use uh, lasers, except with, uh, I mean, few situations uh, that you failed with everything and you want to try something for the patients. The last update regarding melasma is using oral tranexamic acid, also topical now, or, uh, also intralegional. All, um, uh, all the uses of tranexamic acid before this era was mainly with gynecology. They use it for bleeding, but now they use it because it's having anti-melanogenesis effect. Plus, uh, it works in the blood vessels where the melasma is having some, uh, let's say, aspect of uh, vascular uh, abnormalities. You have to rule out melasma like DLE, discoid globus. It is very, 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 very rare, but you have to take it in consideration if the patient is not improving and having other signs of uh, lupus, you have to rule out discoid lupus. Now coming for pigmentary demarcation lines. So lines of demarcation between dorsal surfaces, which are relatively hyperpigmented, and ventral surfaces, which is uh, relatively hypopigmented, we call it pigmentary demarcation line. So simply this is normal that we can see, especially in dark skin people, uh, physiologic uh, pattern of human pigmentation, so there is no effective treatment. You can see it uh, in different location. You can see here in the chest, you can see here uh, in the dorsal uh, thigh and um, uh, legs, and also you can see it in the face where we call, they call it W shape. And this is very common. And the main issue here is if it is in the face, sometimes sometimes it has been treated even by dermatologists as melasma. And the patient will never improve with any treatment like laser or peeling, usually just uh, sun avoidance. And sometimes we use, under pressure, we use uh, some bleaching creams. But in my opinion, it's not that effective. Thank you. And uh, I would like to thank the organizing committee again. I would like uh, to thank Dr. Loi Salah. I think we have some questions, Dr. Loi. Uh, thank you very much for this excellent presentation. Very comprehensive and to the point as usual, Dr. Saad. So I, we have a lot of questions. We'll see if time will allow. I'll start with the first one. It is my personal question. Uh, hypopigmentation after laser treatment. What do you do with it? Is there any so treatment? Hypo hypopigmentation after you mean laser head removal or? Laser head removal. Okay, laser removal, it's commonly, let's say, not, not commonly, but it's not that rare. We see it after what they call it Q-switch laser, or in the community, they call it laser tashkir. So this yes. one, we have we have seen uh, some cases. Unfortunately, there is no effective treatment. Sometimes it improves with time, uh, but if it is really depigmented, we end up with either doing eczema laser or even we do melanocyte transplantation. So we treat it actually as, as vitiligo, more or less. Okay. Vitiligo. There was a question about the duration of treatment vitiligo. Mm -hmm. How long do you treat them for? Okay, so as we know that vitiligo is is uh, is a chronic disease. Uh, so if you treat a patient, unfortunately, you cannot predict what will happen. Usually, we imagine uh, like if the patient is is coming to you, that is he active or inactive. Usually, we have to interfere uh, if the patient is. Uh, uh, active, so we give him the treatment that will stop the progression, actually. Uh, mm -hmm. Then we will start repigmentation. Usually we, we treat the patients until either there is no further improvement and you exhaust all the options, or the patient is in complete remission. Mm -hmm. uh, other than this, we uh, actually use the patient and usually we use like alternative way, like give him some, sometimes topical, sometimes we give him phototherapy, then we alternate with other modalities and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, there was another question about the difference between nevus anemicus and mm -hmm. nevus depigmentosus. How do how can we differentiate? Yeah, usually we use it. We use a glass. Uh, we apply it in the nevus. If um, uh, I mean um, uh, the nevus become uh, not clear. That means this mm -hmm. is nevus uh, anemicus because it's because of uh, abnormalities in the blood vessels. 
So when you when you um, uh, like do, uh, do let's, let's say atrogenic or external blanching, it will disappear. Yes. But if you apply apply the glass on the nevus tibiumtosis, nothing will happen because it's really hypopigmented. Uh huh. Okay. Perfect. So another question: uh, the when you treat petriasis versicolor, you mentioned that the change of color going back to normal takes some time. Mm -hmm. Okay. So how would you clinically know that it is treated? Mm -hmm. To be honest, it's sometimes difficult to judge, but if you mm -hmm. see a patient clinically, by history, he's not having itching, and by examination, he's not having scales, there is no erythema, and um, I mean, you treated him for enough time, like a few weeks, most, mm -hmm. most likely the patient is uh, clear. Sometimes we mm -hmm. take scraping to make sure there is no more mm -hmm. fungi, but uh, yes. I agree with you, sometimes it's difficult because it takes time. Yes. Uh, there is another question about the role of a fractional laser in hyperpigmentation. Maybe it's a bit advanced one, but uh, what mm -hmm. do you think of it? Is it effective? If it's not? Uh, to be honest, um, up to my knowledge, it's not that effective usually. Sometimes it can be used in specific, I mean, diseases like, like what we call it, macular amyloidosis. There's some evidence that it works. But in mm -hmm. generally, it's not well-known modality for hyperpigmentation. Sometimes they, even our skin color, it causes hyperpigmentation. So it's yes. not, at, at least it's not, I mean, uh, first line treatment. Okay. Going back to vitiligo, uh, we have got many questions. <laughs> sure. So uh, I'm thankful for the questions. They're very interactive. So uh, what type of steroid do you usually use in vitiligo? What type of? Steroid, topical steroid. Uh, steroid, okay. Uh, it depends on the age and location mainly. So if you have, for example, like a patient, uh, he's adult and he's having over the body like um, over trunk, we use like mometazone fury weight, uh, okay. which is in, in Saudi Arabia, either Elika or Elico. And we use it in the weekend, once like on Friday and once on, on Thursday. Uh, okay. If it is in the face or the patient is a child, we use uh, sometimes what we call it... Um, uh, very, very uh, mild uh, steroid like Locoid, which is uh, beta metazone, um, I think, Valerate. Uh, I have to recheck. And yes. uh, sometimes we use uh, also hydrocortisone acetate, which is the mildest one, especially if he's a child like uh, below two years. Uh, okay. And it's very important to mention using the steroid over um, thin areas like axillary, um, uh, even uh, inner thighs. We don't recommend it, uh, especially we have protopic, which is tacrolimus, a good alternative and less side effects because we are afraid of uh, straying. Perfect. Okay. Uh, I think we will stop now. You can, uh, if Dr. Saad has some time, he can answer the questions directly in the chat box. Thank you all for okay. the questions and your interaction. Thank you, Dr. Saad, again for, the, like for the amazing Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we will present our next lecture, Dr. Abdullah al aqil who is an assistant professor at King Saud University in Riyadh. He will be talking about a huge topic, which is a pediatric dermatology, and he has divided it into two parts. So we will start with the first part, and then we'll take some questions, and then we'll go with the second part and conclude our session and our course at the end. Uh, Dr. Abdullah, the mic is yours. Thank you, Roy. Um, I just want to make sure if um, that I can, that the screen is fine. I mean, yeah, we see? can see your screen. Just one second. I'm not sure. No, wait one second. Yes, I have many presentations here. Yeah. So this is a huge topic. Good oh, luck with that. Thank you, Ray, uh, really, for having me. Um, uh, we will be discussing today, as you mentioned, a vast topic on which uh, I try to choose the most common and um, the most useful dermatoses for uh, for you to that you might face in your in your clinical practice. Uh, this presentation will be mostly scenario based, on which uh, I'll be throwing some MCQs here and there uh, along the way to spice up a bit the learning process. So um, let's have some fun. Uh, the first case here, as you see, is a six-month-old child that presents with symmetrical eczematous eruptions on the uh, eruption on the cheeks, 
uh, elbows and anterior aspect of the knees. So the rash responds to a mild topical steroid, but flares up whenever the cream is stopped. So what is the most likely cause of this rash, given the fact, given the history and the, the clinical presentation? You can vote. I'm not sure when should we. Will the answers appear, Lo A? Yeah, you will see them once they're done. Okay. It takes around 10 to 20 seconds. Okay, nice. So 60% um, um, answered atopic dermatitis, while 14 on, and seborrheic dermatitis, and 24 contact. Okay, so. The uh, correct answer is uh, atopic dermatitis. The presentation of it clinically goes more with atopic dermatitis. We have these eczematous lesions over the cheeks and the exact location of atopic dermatitis. It's, in, 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 if you want to speak about seborrheic dermatitis, it's, it's more oily and greasy. We call it in, in Arabic eczema uh, duhniya. It, it rarely uh, comes this extensive. The extensivity and the location is really against seborrheic dermatitis in this case. Contact dermatitis as well is from its name. It's, there's something that is contact on that skin, but as we see, it's a bit extensive for something um, to be in contact with the skin all over the body. So it's less likely. Tinea corporis is a fungal infection. Tinea is fungal, corporis is corpse, and tinea corporis like fungal infection over the body because we have many, many tinea's and we love terminologies in dermatology. So we have tinea capitis over the scalp, corporis over the body and, and etc. So corporis, they are more, they are more like annular uh, uh, ring-like lesions and the history always points out more to it. Uh, and it doesn't come as extensive as this. So atomic dermatitis is a chronic lesion. Th these things that we need to know, please, when we explain to the parents, this is very, very, very crucial and important. We, we need to tell them that it's chronic. We face this like every day I do. I face this every day. Parents come to me after shopping, uh, many, many physicians before me, and, and none of them, I'm not sure if that's true, but as they say, none of them has ever told them that this is a chronic condition, which means that it comes and goes. They need to know that, that it comes and goes. Even if we treat it and, it and it disappears completely, it might reoccur. And they need to know that because if that, if, if that information isn't present in, in the parents' mind, because we do uh, um, deal with, with the parents mostly, uh, they will think that your diagnosis is false. They will think that your treatment is false and they will do doubt your ability and, and as a physician and that in a way that you won't like. And they will badmouth you that uh, in, a, in a bad way. So they need, you need to always say that. You need to tell them that, look, listen, this is a straightforward case. It's a simple case. We can treat it. We know the treatment, but it might come back. It might reoccur and, 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 and the triggers are many, uh, especially now in winter, you might see that, that the recurrence rate is higher than that in other seasons. Um, uh, so that's, that's the first information that they need to know that it is chronic. Number two, non-contagious. It's not contagious because yes, they do ask that question. Could they play? Could they go to school? Could they play with their siblings? Yes, they can. It's not contagious. Yes, they can. Pruritic, so it's itchy as well. So we need, if you face um, an eczema-like lesion uh, eruption that's not itchy, you should, you should have a huge question mark that this is not atopic dermatitis. So the, the, the three important things are when you explain after, after establishing your diagnosis that this is chronic, this is non-contagious, and it's itchy. So uh, atopic dermatitis is one of the most common skin disorders in developed countries. It affects up to 20% of children, which is a huge number, and 1% to 3% of adults, and mostly develops before the age of five, and typically clears by adolescents. That's true. They, you need to add this as well in your, in your explanation, because as I always say, I mean, um, atopic dermatitis is easy to diagnose and you have like immediately, once they come in, you know the diagnosis, you know, you, you already have the plan put in your head before they even take a seat. The thing is that you will spend the next 20 minutes explaining to them, what is this? And one of the things that you need to explain, plus the three, the three points that we have already established is that 
um, they, they, the atopic dermatitis has a grow out tendency. That means that they will grow out of it. That's a good thing. That's a very good thing. You need to tell them that, that it will get better with time. And uh, that's, that's a bit reassuring for them. And, and that's a thing you really want to at least add some positivity in your education to the parents. So this is a bit of a philosophical um, statement because we do have many, many term terminologies in dermatology. We love, we love terminologies. So eczema and atopic dermatitis, we, we just throw these names, like this patient has eczema. Eczema is a vague terminology, it's, it's a wider term terminology than atopic dermatitis. So it refers mostly to, uh, to any inflammatory lesion, red, that itches, we just call it eczema. Well, while atopic dermatitis is more specific, um, that's true, but that between dermatologists, when we, uh, when we said that this patient has eczema, we just immediately think of atopic dermatitis, but that's not entirely correct um, to do. So atopic dermatitis is often the first manifestation of the atopic march. I'm, I'm sure that most of the pediatricians here already know that. That means that patients who start with atopic dermatitis might develop asthma and then allergic rhinitis with time. So. The second question will be, what percentage of children with atopic dermatitis also have or will develop asthma or allergic rhinitis? These beautiful questions, you know, these questions that, that exam questions that always try to trick you with these very tight numbers, <laughs> that uh, they just, they increase the possibility of you picking the wrong answer. It brings them joy. So. Let's see the answers. Oh, nice. But that's not entirely correct. The answer is, is D, 50 to 80%. So to this extent, that 50% of patients that you might that you will face with a topic dermatitis might have uh, develop um, asthma or allergic conitis with time. This is a huge number. Very conservative when you chose B. Um, third question, which of the following recommendations uh, would you provide to the mother, the anxious mother that asks questions nonstop? I do, I, I do understand, but that will always happen. They ask questions nonstop. So A, would you apply once or twice moisturizing agents, or would you just apply a topical steroid on the face for about two weeks or until improvement, uh, a given antihistamine, cleanser, or all of the above? Good. That's reassuring at least. Yes. The answer is all of the above. Moisturizing is crucial. It's the fundamental, it's the, it's the key, it's the keystone of every of, of, of any treatment of atopic dermatitis. You must always tell them to apply uh, moisturizing creams or agents nonstop. Personally, I prefer Vaseline on wet skin, but they can um, get any uh, non-aromatic uh, cream uh, or ointment uh, to, to apply um, on, the, on, their, on their child if they have the means to do so. So, uh, so yes, moisturizing agents uh, is, is crucial. That's a correct answer. Hydrocortisone 2.5, we have 1% and 2.5%. Uh, ointment, I mean, if, if the, those who don't know the difference between cream and ointment, cream is the, it's the white, it's the whitey. Uh, material ointment is, is the transparent, that, which means that we have the steroids inside Vaseline uh, product, so which is which makes it more effective, which makes it last longer on the skin. So we have hydrocodone ointment to the face, twice for two weeks or until improvement. That's another correct answer. I, I can be more aggressive than hydrocodone. I, I really think that hydrocodone is a, is a weak steroid, which which it is. It it is a, it's classified as weak. Uh, weak potency. I can I can sometimes hit harder, uh, but for those who are corticophobic, and I know that many are amongst you, that we do give hydrocortisone. Uh, at this this is the least that you can give over the face, and you need to give him even stronger over the body, like mometazone, as my previous uh, colleague mentioned, uh, Dr. Saad. So mometazone we do give sometimes over the body, uh, twice, for two weeks or until improvement. 
this is some. This is a, another thing that I I want to emphasize on. Uh, for those who are who are who have this fear from from topical steroids, who give the 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 weakest topical steroid, the weakest, and then they just while they are and and try to emphasize on the point that do not exceed three days or five days is false, is nonsense. Do not do that. Do not do that. Do not tell the mother who's already anxious and then you are anxious as well and, 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 and increasing that sen sensation in her that do not increase three days. So if you tell her to don't, don't put it more than three days, she'll put it for two only. If you tell her don't, don't put it for five, she'll put it only for three. And, and, and what happens is that for those who are really, really compliant, they will apply for five days. They will see some improvement, they, and then they will stop. They will not continue. And then they will come back to you or just, just see another person and said, we know I applied the steroid for five days and didn't uh, with no success, uh, which is not true because it's a successful treatment, but the duration was not sufficient. So what I try to say is that you apply cream, th these st steroids twice a day until improvement do not exceed two weeks, for example, in any way, you might give them another appointment to see in two or three weeks, but do not exceed this, um, this duration. I mean, we cannot predict, I mean, we are physicians, we're not witches, we cannot pr predict the future. We, I, think the, I don't think we have the ability to do so. So at least be more flexible when you give the, when you give the, um, uh, when you give the hydrocortisone, like give it to them. It's okay for two weeks, up to two weeks, until improvement. If if it if the patient improves before, then just stop stop the stop the topical and continue on moisturizing. You don't need you don't even need to taper it. Just just stop it. It's fine. You will see them in two or three weeks. It's okay. Hydroxyzine, which is an antihistamine, um, uh, you can give it. It's, it's for it's for the, it's it's a symptomatic treatment. You can give that. I won't disagree completely. I'm not a big fan of giving antihistamine. That's for sure. I, don't, I rarely, I seldom give. I very rarely do give hydroxyzine unless the mother is really, really complaining. Like, the, my 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 baby is not sleeping well. He's not eating and stuff. Then at that time, I might, I might push and give hydroxyzine uh, for a very small duration just for to help them sleep a bit. Because once you give the proper treatment, topical steroids, and moisturizing, all the symptoms will go away. So he will he will stop itching. And everything will, will be fine. I don't need. I don't see the necessity of giving antihistamines. I see that practice all, all the way. I'm not a big fan of it. And the thing is that the 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 when you know you know when you prescribe all these creams and these bottles of antihistamine, and the patient, the mother is coming out your clinic with this big bag and sack of medications, does not necessarily make you look smart. I mean, you you, you we really need something effective. Uh, and, and do not just bombard the patient and the mother with, with all these right and left medications that you don't really know what worked when you do such. But still, I won't exclude it entirely. So uh, mild cleanser, of course, you can, you can give a mild cleanser. I won't be against that. So the, the correct answer is E, all of the above. So using topical immunomodulators as well, such as tacrolimus, which is called um, uh, protopic or viotopic, or pemicrolimus, which is elidel, as use, is as useful as useful for maintenance and safe for long durations. I can sometimes do that when we have this chronic atopic dermatitis, which reoccur every time we stop um, the, the the topical steroids uh, as maintenance to just try our, try my best to um, prevent any relapse that could happen every three four days when they stop the steroids. That could happen, but the thing is that do not give a topical immunomodulator such as protopic or biotopic on an already inflamed skin because it burns, it stings, and they will hate you. Either, either the, the, the baby or an adult, do not give it on an inflamed skin. It will sting and burn and they will hate you as hell. Like they will come and complain. So it's a good drug, not on inflamed skin. You just hit hard with steroids and then you can maintain with, with immunomodulators. That will be easier. Another, another modality of treatment is phototherapy. So you can give uh, when it's very extensive and you have the means to do so. If you work in a hospital, then, then, then you can, uh, I mean, refer the patient to do phototherapy. 
narrow band mostly. Uh, systemic therapy uh, in cases of moderate to severe or severe uh, atopic dermatitis, which we do face in the hospital. Sometimes we give um, uh, steroids, systemic steroids. I'm not a big fan of it, but still, still a treatment option. Cyclosporine and methotrexate. I do sometimes use interchangeably. Sometimes between them, I start with cyclosporine and then I switch to MTX if needed, and as I theoprene as well. Now we have a new biologic, uh, dopilumab, which have uh, promising effects with less side effects. So let's see what it, what, what it will give as a positive impact in the future. So this is another, another question. The mother would like more information regarding the association between food, uh, allergies, and atopic dermatitis. This is always a question in your clinic. What would you tell her? Read carefully. Okay, good, good. So the correct answer is C, that's true. So a positive allergen test proves that the allergy is clinically relevant. That's not true. Um, you can have a positive, um, if you have an inflamed skin and whatever test you try to do, RAS test, whatever, you will have everything positive. You do not want that. It, this, will get, this will be very confusing to you and the parents. And I see that a lot, that pe pe some patients who are, have like moderate to severe um, uh, topic dermatitis and they go to a physician who just orders a blood test with rust that comes back positive to everything, everything. They're, I don't know, they're just trying to kill the baby, everything like milk, uh, everything. He, the baby's not eating anything, which, which is not, helpful to say. I mean, if you're, uh, you're just trying to uh, treat the atopic dermatitis, but in another way, you're, the, the baby, you're killing the baby. So, so that's not true. What you should do is any test that you will, you will, you will try to perform is you can do that after, after you contain this eruption, after you contain this inflammatory process as much as you can. Then you can, and when everything, the, everything will be clear after that. So elimination of food allergens, B, elimination of food allergens in patients with atopic dermatitis and confirmed food allergy will not lead to clinical improvement. That's not true. If you have something already proven by, by, by an expert who already saw this patient and some food allergen and already confirmed food allergy, of course, when you eliminate that, that will lead to clinical improvement. That's for sure. But food allergy is, more, is a more likely trigger if the onset or worsening of the, of the atopic dermatitis correlates with exposure to food. That's true. Because, and the, and the D is of course not true. So we have the role of allergy and atopic dermatitis remains controversial. Uh, what we know is that atopic dermatitis is a genetic. It's, it's, it's a genetic, the, the, the disease affected is filigree uh, and it has, it's, it seldom has anything to do with, with food allergies. Yes, yes, they are susceptible to have um, some, some uh, episodes when they are exposed to some food, but that doesn't mean that the food allergy itself is the cause. Um, that's, so many patients with atopic dermatitis have sensitization to food and environmental allergens. However, evidence of allergen sensitization is not a proof of a clinically relevant allergy, and food allergy uh, as a cause of AD is uncommon. So it's not a really a cause because the cause of it is genetic, but they do have the susceptibility to flare when they are, um, uh, when they are exposed to some, some allergens, that's true. So we need, what we need to do is that we need to contain this eruption because when you do so, um, life will be easier, of course. So once the skin is inflamed and they are uh, exposed to any allergen, it will get worse. So they have this impression that they have this eruption on the skin and every time they give milk, they, every time they give whatever, it gets worse. It's not because they're allergic to it, it's because they're more sense, I mean, they have the sensitization to it, it's, it's, it's more. 
So elimination of food allergen in patients with AD and confirmed food allergy, as we said, can lead to clinical improvement. So second case, we have patient with a, uh, so I'm sorry, this is a patient with atopic dermatitis or more susceptible to cutaneous viral and bacterial infections, which is true. So we have a herpes simplex, which is called eczema herpeticum, the first picture um, up left. This is eczema herpeticum. Sometimes it can be very, very severe that the patient needs to hospitalization and IV uh, antiviral uh, agents like acyclovir. So um, it is very important, like when we see such secondary infections, this is another thing that the, the treatment of atopic dermatitis is not just to, to uh, alleviate the, the sensation of itchiness. It's not just that. We are, we are um, trying our best not to have, for example, post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, hyperpigmentation that could disfigure sometimes the, um, the, um, the, the baby or the child or the, the patient, and to avoid as much as we can these, these secondary infections that might necessitate sometimes hospitalization and could leave some scarring effect as, as eczema herpeticum can do. It can leave some scarring uh, lesions and we, we don't want that. Molluscum cont contagiosum, a uh, second, upright picture and uh, warts as well. The second, the, the, the down picture on the right. So these are all viral, uh, viral uh, infections and bacterial infections, uh, bacterial infection with staph aureus as in pathogenization as we've seen. So case number two, this is interesting. So a two years old a child is referred to you with a widespread rash that has followed up, uh, an upper RTI, a respiratory tract infection. On examination, the child has this rash consisting of a small, pink, flat-topped monomorphic papule symmetrically involving the face, buttocks, and extremities. And it's not particularly, particularly itchy. So we'd see this. It's very nice. You see, just again, just to see the, the lesions. So, the question is, what would be your diagnosis? I mean, this is easy. Hopefully. Okay, atopic dermatitis number one, psoriasis. I mean, when you face something like that, this is an MCQ question, like an exam question. Sometimes you think that the most fancy words can be appealing. Like psoriasis, atopic dermatitis, urticaria, and genotic cross syndrome. I'm sure that some, some of you have no idea what this is, but and it just screams out and two Italian guys call this syndrome and it just appears uh, upon these MCQs. It just appeals that, just choose me because it is the answer. So papular acrodermatitis of childhood, um, which is genotype cross T syndrome, is the answer. Now I thought it was easy because, uh, so what is this? Papular acrodermatitis of childhood. These two Italian guys just tried to describe this uh, papular it's, it's a name, it's a papular, it's acrodermatitis and it's in childhood. So what we see is that it's a viral exanthem. That's a good thing. So it's not genetic. It's a viral exanthem that may occur following infections with any of, of, of several viral angel, agents. So EBV, CMV, Coxsackie, rest viruses, whatever the rest viruses, influenza, power influenza, adenovirus, coronavirus, HHV6, uh, Parvo B19, rotaviruses, all these viruses can contribute to this viral exanthem. Uh, hepatitis B, uh, we used to do, when we used to see genetic cross what we should, we used to do always look and ask for a hepa, hepatitis panel. We don't do that actually anymore, unless you have clinically, uh, uh, if you have some suspicious uh, suspicions uh, clinically, then, then yes. 
uh, you have uh, a history, past history, you have a, a hepatomegaly on examination, then you do so, yes. But we don't do it anymore. So hepatitis B is possible but uncommon in Italy and Japan. Uh, this rash uh, is between one and six years. And upper resp uh, symptoms, fever and lymphadenopathies may be present and prior to the eruption. So this is a given given. So there was an infection before and uh, which is against the topic dermatitis because the topic dermatitis is, itch, is, is sorry, it's genetic. And it's not itchy, again, against the topic dermatitis because the topic dermatitis is itchy. As you've mentioned, the three most important things, it's chronic, it's uh, non-contagious, and it's, it's itchy. And this is not particularly itchy as mentioned in the history. So it's against it. And psoriasis, because some, some of you chose psoriasis. And yes, we have some, sometimes this, psoriatic eruption we call uh, uh, gut tate psoriasis after a throat infection which is bacterial mostly uh, which is called gut tate which means like some some small dots like and like rain dots uh, as we put our fingers in, in in the water and then we splash it so these small dots scaly erythematous scaly uh, eruption on 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 this on the body on the skin this is called gut tate psoriasis that we might see after a throat infection it doesn't necessarily look at like the, the presentation that we just had. So it's less likely it could be a good taste psoriasis. So treatment is supportive. If it's itchy, then we, which, is, which we rarely find, uh, we can give moisturizers. It's very supportive because it's self-limited. So we'll, it will take some time. Again, you need to explain that very well because they will, if you don't, they'll come to you next day and tell you that it didn't go away. Uh, it might take two to three months for it, for it to, to, receive, uh, to resolve completely. Some hypopigmentation may persist far more than that. So you, they, you need to know and they need to know that just to reassure. And as I mentioned, like hepatitis serology should be performed when clinically suspicious, when only clinically suspicious. So case number three, this is interesting. So a 16-week-old male that presented in the clinic with a red papular nodular lesion on the right shoulder. This lesion appeared three weeks earlier, and the child was born four weeks preterm and is in perfect health. So which are the following options? Are more th 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 this you can choose uh, more than one. Uh, which of the following options are in favor of the diagnosis of anti-hemangioma? I'm not sure you can choose more than no, more than one, but we have um, more than one answer in this in this question. Okay. Okay. So we will explain that. This is an infantile hemangioma, for sure. But why did we say it's infantile hemangioma? Because it's raised? Yes, of course, because if it's not raised, then it's not infantile hemangioma. An infantile hemangioma is a, is a tumor. It does start sometimes as a small, like small macule, like a small erythematous macule, and then it grows with time. That's true, but it's originally, it's a tumor that we, we classify as a tumor. Is it acquired or is it congenital? No, it is acquired because we have infantile hemangioma and we have congenital hemangiomas, which is completely a different thing that we can, we can see immediately after birth and we can sometimes diagnose and detect it uh, through ultrasound while still unborn. So it is acquired, it's not congenital, it is raised, that's true. The location is located at the base of the limb. Not necessarily, we can find it anywhere. The infant is a boy. Mostly we see infantile hemangiomas in, in female patients, mostly. We can see them, of course, in male, but being a boy isn't, doesn't, doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, it's not in favor of it, but we, mostly female, mostly preterm, the weight is less than 2.5 kg after birth. Then yes, this, this, is, uh, this is mostly, infantile hemangioma. So as we mentioned, like we have vascular tumor, tumors and vascular malformations. The vascular tumors we have is a demonstration of cellular hyperplasia. 
We don't know why, but this, this is what happens. It, that proliferates over time. So what we have is that after birth, it might not be detected that they had this very small erythematous whatever, it, it passed by and non-detected. And then after some time, just grew, grew, grew nonstop. It will start the proliferative phase. The growing phase will be up to four to six months, some say five to six months. And then it will stop, stagnate, and then with time it will regress by itself. So it pro proliferates over time. It's often not present, present, uh, present at birth, as we, as we just mentioned. So this so the, um, an example of a vascular tumor is infantile hemogen, one of the examples. Uh, vascular malformations, um, they're mostly composed of dilated dysplastic vessels. Usually, usually they are present at birth, such as capillary malformations, the port wine stain, as we mentioned, as, we, uh, as, as most of you know, but we call it capillary malformation, lymphatic, malformations, venous malformation, we, have, we can have a mixed arteriovenous malformation, we have many others. So just this slide, just to make it simple in terms of classification. So the non-congenital nature of infantile human genome is a key factor in the diagnosis. Uh, it's the most common tumor in infancy, affects approximately one in 20 infants, and is even more common in premature infants, as we have mentioned. So what would you say, like this, there's a spontaneous involution um, of, the, of the tumor uh, and the benign location of the lesion here in this patient is not favorable for any systemic treatment. What we do is we can give systemic treatment in such cases, beta blocker uh, or topical treatment as well. So we have three, three types of, 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 um, of treatment. We can we just abstinence, we can give nothing. It's up to, up to it's, it's, a, it's, it's debatable. Uh, certainly, if the location is not uh, severely cosmetically, uh, cosmetically disfiguring or uh, vitally important, like over the eyelid that could, could occlude the eye or the nose that could have some uh, obstruction in, 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 the, in ways of breathing, um, then other, other than that, it's negotiable. So we can say, look, listen, we can give nothing. It will go away. It will need some time, but, but it might leave some redundant skin. Uh, it depends on how large the tumor is. Uh, it might leave some smart, small telangiectasia that we can uh, deal with with some lasers after some so, so many years, not now. Um, we can make it easier and faster if we apply topical uh, treatments such as Timurol. This is a, a topical beta blocker as well. And in severe cases or in cases that could be life-threatening or cosmetically disfiguring, even if you have a, a, a big infantile hemangioma in the female, which we see mostly in females, over the nipple, for example, over the private areas, then we, I do give systemic treatment immediately. Um, because, yeah, it, we don't want to go to, through that process having uh, this huge psychological impact because sometimes parents are, are, are very protective in a harming way. And they will not try to give any, any treatment to their uh, children that might harm them, neglecting the fact that this, the, the, um, the outcome, the, the results of, of this will follow them after many, many years. And when they have to go through surgery or they have to go through lasers and psychological impact and this. And so they need to know that, always they need to know that. I will always put them on the spot to make, the, to make sure that they made the correct decision. Um, we can stop here for, for a small break if you want, Luay. Yes, uh, we can have a, take a couple of questions if you want and then continue with your cases. Yes, of Is course. That okay? It's okay. Perfect. Perfect. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. The first part was tough. A lot of nice cases, great discussion. Uh, everyone enjoyed it here. I can see from the questions. So uh, one of the interesting questions, there are a lot of questions, we can't cover them all, but one of the interesting questions, can uh, contact dermatitis, is it associated with atopic dermatitis? Can you see both in the same patient? Oh, yes, we can. We can. We can see that. That's not, we can see both, yes. That's not, uh, that's not, um, uh, that's not contraindicated. We can see both. We can see contact dermatitis with anyone. That's not, that's not the, uh, the problem. The, the, the major thing that we need to know, why, why am I focusing on atopic dermatitis is because it's genetic. Mm -hmm. And it's chronic. Yes. Contract dermatitis is there's an external factor that caused it. 
once you don't um, make yourself uh, um, exposed to that triggering factor, then your life will be easier. But atopic dermatitis will always exist and be there and have these chronic episodes coming back and, and coming and going that will always affect the parents mostly. Contact is, 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 in, is, is less um, bothering, I can say. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, what about, uh, let's go to the hemangiomas. Uh, who can prescribe propranolol or timolol in hemangiomas, dermatologist or pediatrician? And do they need to be hospitalized in the beginning because of the side effects? Oh, that's very good. That's a very good question. Um, you're asking uh, me, I do that. I'm a dermatologist mm -hmm. and I always prescribe. I have many, many patients under propranolol. And I think that dermatologists are capable and have the ability to do so. Um, at the beginning, like because propranolol was discovered in 2008, 2008 it was yes. discovered that its, its efficacy was it's not that long time ago. So we were very, very cautious and careful when dealing with this drug. So any patient that we wanted to put under um, uh, under this medication, we needed to hospitalize and do ECGs and stuff. It was it was yes. it was a bit it was a bit. Um, um, it, it was difficult. Now, um, it's just much, much easier. Now we know the drug, we understand the drug, we know the side effects, it's easier now to, to deal with it. I, I personally uh, prescribe them as outpatients um, um, and I rarely, rarely, rarely have any, any problems with that. Okay, perfect. So what about the danger signs in infantile hemangiomas? Danger, uh, danger. Are there any signs that would uh, make you start treatment uh, or wait? Yes, look, look listen, um, most of yes, yes, I do. Do you hear me? Yeah, okay. Yes, so, I can hear you well. Yes, mostly the, the thing is that the location, the, the location is very important. And sometimes um, mm -hmm. they do ulcerate. Sometimes the, the, the tumors do ulcerate. Even if it's in a benign, it's a, in, a, in a benign location, uh, ulceration is not something that mm -hmm. you want in your child because it hurts and they'll cry nonstop and it will leave sometimes a huge scar that you don't want and it's prone to secondary infections. So what I do is I, I, I do start systemic treatment if I see ulcerations in, in, in any kind, but you, know, you can see ulcerations mostly in big tumors. Um, uh, so in, in normally big tumors are already I already start before ulcerating, unless unless I do receive a patient first time with ulceration. But I, I don't I don't wait for the for the tumor when it's big to ulcerate before starting um, propranolol. And of course, as I mentioned, the location is very very important because uh, to start. I mean, if it's covering the eye, if it's in the nose, sometimes yeah. So we need to know that there are many other types. If it's in the beard area, then there could be laryngeal involvement. If it's very, it's there, mm -hmm. there are many like. The malaria type, then you have to look for uh, any, any liver involvement. That's another case. I'm just talking, trying to be concise on the very easy ones um, that they might face because if they do face segmental types or huge types, I, I, I do prefer that they refer this, this patient to, to a professional who can deal with it. Okay, perfect. I think we'll stop now with the questions. There are a lot, but uh, we can answer them later on. You can continue yeah. with your cases and interest in this. Kind of. Thank you. Okay, you want us to continue, right? Yes, please. Okay. So we have this patient, six month old male that has this congenital ultimatus mark on the frontal region. This lesion becomes more visible when he cries, but its size has not changed since birth. So what are the arguments against infantile hemangioma in this case? Uh, I think this is a, a multi-answer question, but it's okay. You can choose whatever you want to choose and we'll discuss after. Because clearly this is not an infantile hemangioma. As we mentioned, we know that we know how it looks like. It's a tumor. It's not, it doesn't give this presentation. So what are the arguments that is against infantile hemangioma in this case? Okay. Good. So 
the lesions located on the median line, well, you can find um, some tumors as well in the median line. So, um, so this is what is against infantile hemangioma is congenital, as we have mentioned. Uh, infantile hemangiomas are not congenital. The lesion is stable in size. Yes, that's true because, as you mentioned before, that they, they have the growing phase, uh, the first four to five to six months in infantile hemangiomas, which is not the case here. Uh, the lesion is plain and macular. That's true. The patient is a male again. So, yeah. So the congenital and flat nature of this apparently vascular lesion rules out infantile hemangioma as a diagnosis. So what is this? This is a capillary malformation, or which we call sometimes the port wine stain. This is a capillary malformation. We can, the port wine stain is, is another you know, terminology, which I prefer personally as a capillary malformation. It's very, very common in infants. They are stable in size and tend to fade with time. Uh, the lesions that are in the glabular region here in the midline uh, region, they tend to fade with time. So even if they come to you like planning, what is this? It's a capillary malformation. It's okay, it will go over time. Uh, we have other certain areas of the skin that could be affected other than the, the globular area, uh, which could be the, the nape of the neck, which is in the, in the occiput behind the head here. Uh, that doesn't really go away. It's a capillary malformation, of course, but it doesn't disappear, doesn't go away. But luckily, it could be covered by hair. So, so yeah, I mean, they will live their life fine without even noticing that they have this unless they, uh, one day they just decide to um, shave their heads and be bald. That's another thing. Uh, and the lumbar region, of course. So they don't fade with time. The, the, the only uh, area that fades with time is the, is the glabular and interbral um, area. And systemic treatment has no indications in capillary malformation whatsoever. We do not give any systemic treatment in this case whatsoever. For strongly marked lesions, vascular laser treatment can be discussed. When we have like a big capillary malformation, wherever and on the extremity, for example, that is very, very, um, um, visible, that is very, very um, erythematous, sometimes violaceous, then we can, yes, we can discuss the fact that we can do some lasers because some capillary malformations are um, associated with some syndromes. We don't want to go through that. It's, it's a big topic. But in general, uh, capillary malformations, we do not require any treatment, any system of treatment uh, in, in whatsoever. Uh, the, the malformations that are in the glabular area tend to fade away. Those on the other region, in the nape of the neck, just forget about it, it will be covered by hair. If, if you find these lesions on the extremities, then we can discuss laser um, uh, with time. Another thing that you might face always, always, like, sorry, is the cradle cap. We see this always. You can see this among the seborrheic dermatitis as well. It's very, very common in the first three months of life, and it could be associated with the proliferation of metastasia, the some yeasts. And as you mentioned, uh, in regards to the first case, uh, that the thick and greasy scale on the scalp, that th this, this manifestation of cradle cap that could be a part of seborrheic dermatitis is greasy. It's oily, it's greasy. It's not like a topic dermatitis. And uh, the greasy erythema and mild scaling behind the ears on the central face, the flexural folds and diaper area. So usually it's non pruritic and it can go away because uh, again that you can you can see um, some parents who visit you in, in, your, in, your, in your clinic asking you many many questions about this. So just reassure them it's fine it's okay it's self limiting, um, and the treatment are are, are, are many. Uh, you can give whatever oil you want, uh, Vaseline whatever you can do that and antifungal shampoo sometimes, some, some keratolytic as well, and ketoconazole because, because there's some proof that malassezia uh, can, can play a role here. So antifungal um, treatment um, uh, could be effective. Creams as well. So, some low potency topical steroids I really give, but it's, it's mentioned as, as one of the treatments to control any erythema and inflammation, which we rarely see. Another thing, diaper dermatitis um, or napkin dermatitis that we sometimes we call. <laughs> it's very common 
and infants is very, very common. So variants of di diaper dermatitis, we have very, very variants. The common ones, the common ones, irritant type, contact dermatitis, we have infectious, of course, you can sometimes have infectious candida. If you see this area, like so red, the, these red erythematous plaques, and then you see some small satellite papules here and there, then you should think of candida, you should think of infection. Uh, severe dermatitis as well, it could be a cause. Uncommon causes that we need to know if we try and treat and treat and still doesn't go away, then we're not, we, we probably did not reach the correct diagnosis. So we have psoriasis that could be uh, a part of di diaper dermatitis and zinc deficiency and acrodermatitis enteropathica, that's what's called. Acrodermatitis enteropathica could be another cause of zinc. It, it, it could be another presentation which is caused by zinc deficiency. And the tricky, tricky histiocytosis. It's the trickiest, even, even for us dermatologists, we always tend to forget that. Histiocytosis can as well um, present in a, um, I mean, could present like, like any other uh, eruption. So we always need to put that in. And that's true that we can, we can detect it sometimes. If you see some papular yellow crusted lesion that we can think of, of histiocytosis, true, but it can always be tricky. So infections, um, uh, contact dermatitis and infections are the most commonest, but uncommon, we should think of these if, if you treat and treat and nothing uh, is, is working. Case number five. So you receive uh, this patient in your clinic. The six-year-old, uh, um, it's not six-year-old, but six-month-old mostly. Uh, this asymptomatic eruption since a couple of months. I'm sure, I mean, most of you might know this already, but the question is what virus is responsible for this condition? Another, another question for the exam question, they love this. But you can narrow it down because either it's HPV or enterovirus or pox virus, and then you choose amongst these. Okay, so most of you think it's it's a human, an HPV, human papillomavirus. Well, this is molluscan contagiosum. It's a pox virus. It's not an HPV. These are not warts. This is molluscan contagiosum. So it's a pox virus, it's not an HPV. Um, so you have this, and the mother is relieved to have the diagnosis. You tell her, well, listen, this is molluscan contagiosum. It has the name of it. Uh, it can be contagious. Um, so she's relieved to know it's not that difficult, but it's not that, it's not that dangerous, but wants to know the treatment. So what would you tell her? Well, should we give cantharidin? Should we give cryotherapy, curtage? Should we not treat? Or should we do or should all, all of the above could be a correct answer. Great. Great, great. So yes. All of the above, all of them are destructive methods. We can use them to, to destruct this virus. We can do that. Uh, sometimes you do give cryotherapy. It's not that easy to do cryotherapy on, on a child because it will be a big fuss, but um, we can give a topical cathartium, for example. We can do curatal sometimes. Again, it's not that easy because you, the, the baby will not let you. And you see a lot of screaming kick and kicking. But the thing is with curtage is that you might have some scars. So I, I personally do not prefer it, but it's, it could be, um, um, it's still a, an option. Or we just can tell the mother, look, listen, we can leave it and it will go away with time. And that's true for many viruses. It will need some time, that's true, but it, it will, 
to definitely go away. It's, it's, it's a pediatric um, infection. We rarely see this in adults, might never do unless the adult is immunocompromised. That's something else. So um, we can do all of it. So children with atopy are less likely to clear on their own. So if you have to have a patient who has a topic dermatitis or whatever, and he has this eruption, for example, on here in the anterior cubital fossa, for example, it's less likely to clear on their own because on in this area, the, the skin barrier is already um, disrupted. Um, it allows for more prolifer proliferation of the virus. He will itch, itch it, and then he will have this auto inoculation. He will um, spread it all over his body. So, so it's, it'll be very difficult for atopic patients to clear on their own. You need to always put that in mind before saying that, hey, listen, listen, there's no treatment. Scratching can spread the lesion in a, lean, in a linear mode, which we call carbonization, carbon phenomenon. And actually there is no consensus on the management of meniscus contagiosum. So it's always a discussion between the parents and you, and it depends on how old the, baby and the child is in your clinic. So the, treatment, the treatments are as such, Cantharidin, we, we don't have it much, but curatage, cryotherapy, topical retinoids, we can do that. It can be irritating, but um, anything we give that could be keratolytic is irritating, can have this, you can have that risk. Emicumid as well is, is more irritating, but we can use that as well. So we have many options. Either we do cryotherapy, it could be easy if the patient is like six, seven years and understanding, we, we can try that. Um, put, put in mind that you might leave some scars, you need to know that, so just be very, very careful. A topical retinoids can, can be a nice um, and safer uh, option, it might take some time, but in any way, uh, it will go away with time. So most cases, relief and uh, self-resolve, sorry, sorry, within six to nine months. The rare cases persist, persist up to five, three to five years, which is, that is very rare. And cover lesions likely to come in contact with other, others with closing. It's had from its name, it's called molluscum contagiosum. Uh, keep fingernails trimmed and short because it's true that, um, as we mentioned, that the, the, they have this tendency to auto inoculate. They just touch themselves all over and they scratch it and then they just, um, have it all over the skin. So avoid scratching as well, especially in atopic patients. You need to always put that in mind and do not share any bath towels. Okay, case number six. You see these type of cases, presentations, and you always suspect a diagnosis of tinea capitis. When examining children with erythematous alopecic patches and a positive history of animal contact. So, you see these and you say, okay, look, listen, this could be a tinea, tinea capitis. What is your, uh, what is the following most appropriate next step? Would you just begin the, treat, begin the treatment with topical antifungals because you know the diagnosis and you don't want to waste time? <laughs> or would you uh, have a biopsy? Would you do an AKOH exam and fungal culture and wait? Or would you do a blood test, blood culture to know exactly what's going on? Okay, great. So, yes, we do the KOH exam and fungal culture. The KOH exam can come immediately positive, that's fast. Fungal culture, yes, we just do that. Sometimes what we do is we can just do the KOH exam, fungal culture, and then we can start the treatment. That's not incorrect. Those who chose the begin, begin the treatment, that's not incorrect. Uh, but we do that after the KOH and fungal culture. But when we begin the treatment, it is not with topical antifungals. Topicals will not work with tinea capitis. It will not work. The infection is very, very deep in the hair apparatus is very, very deep. The bosail of the shot is very, very deep. So a topicals are just, you're just wasting your time. It won't, it won't work. Uh, biopsy, it's, it's, uh, that's a bit invasive. We don't do that. We don't need that. It's not that, I mean, we don't need that. Blood culture will show, will show I mean, we don't, We'll do the blood culture in such cases. We don't do that. But we have something easier. We can do that easier. Like if you have this uh, presentation that you have in front of you and you think you have tinea capitis, even before going for KOH exam and fungal culture, we can do something very easier, which is Wood's lamp. We can try a wood, uh, a, a, some simple lamp, which is light. It's called Wood's lamp, Wood's light. 
and and we can try to just in a dark room and and expose the light on these lesions and we, we can we see we can see some colors and some types of, of infection like it can come positive with greenish fluorescence when it's when it's a, 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 a microsporic infection tunicapetus and we have this trichophytic infection that can be negative i mean so but what I'm trying to say is that even if you try this woods lamp or wood, woods light and it's negative, that does not exclude the possibility of a of diagnosis by tina capitis. If you see it green and fluoresces positively, then yes, you have your diagnosis already, just proceed. But if you have it negative, that doesn't exclude it. So you just need to go again and to, to the next step and do your KOH exam and from the, and from the literature. So tinea capitis is dermatophytosis of the scalp and associated hair. It's very common in African-American children, so mostly um, because of the hair type, spread through direct contact with animals, humans, and fomites. The most common cause in the US is the trichophyton tonsillons. That, as I mentioned, is, could be have the negative woods lamp. On woods lamp, it would be negative. You won't see any color. Um, but in, in Europe, mostly and in, in worldwide, even here in Saudi Arabia, the most common type is microsporum canis, which is an animal to human transmission. So positive woods lamp, you will see that. So most of, mostly you will see in our patients here in Saudi Arabia, you might see, you know, you, mostly you will see a positive, um, positive fluorescence with greenish color under woods lamp. And that uh, will give you your diagnosis, but of course you need to do things correctly, but you will still proceed with your K-Watch exam and your fungal culture. <clears throat> so you can see it as, as such as, as well. These, uh, they, they could be non-inflammatory as these, as, as these black dots you see here, right here, and they could be inflammatory, can, which we called carrion, and we can have both of them. You can have them non-inflammatory, just simple alopecia patch. You can see alopecia, but you see these small dots, some black dots, or you can have it inflammatory, like with alopecia, alopecia patches, very, very inflamed, which we call curion, and we can have both. So broken hairs are a, pro a prominent feature and often presents with postauricular, posterior, cervical, or occipital lymphadenopathy. Always palpate here, you need to always palpate. So as you mentioned, as I mentioned here, uh, topical agents are ineffective. They are ineffective. In tinea capitis, you can find, you can, you can, you can have them effective in tinea corporis, that's true. But in, in tinea capitis, they are ineffective. Um, the drug of choice is grisophobin in cases of microsporic. They, there are many, many studies that that's the study, the, the in comparison between gusophobine and terbinafine. So what we saw in these studies and, and personal, of course, um, experience is that gusophobine is more effective in microsporic uh, infections. In trichophytic infections, terbinafine is more effective. So TT, terbinafine and trichophytic, microsporic and gusophobine. The problem is that we do not really have, it's not that we don't have, we don't have that easy access to gusophobine, especially where I work. So um, it's, it's a very difficult thing to obtain. So I do give etroconazole in, in microsporic patients with, with, uh, with excellent results as well. Uh, terbinafine, I, I do uh, reserve that if I, if I see any trichophytic um, infection. I guess that's that. Uh, so we had, we had one hour. If you have any questions, then we find I'll be happy to take them, Roy. Thank you very much for this excellent presentation. As a whole, it's been amazing. Thank you a lot. And we have a lot of questions. We'll try to take as many as we can before we conclude the conference. So regarding the last topic, the tinea capitis, uh, uh, the question was: If we, if if they have, if they don't have in the primary setting any fungal culture or woods lamp, would you recommend them to start oral antifungal to prevent wasting of time, or not, or refer to dermatology? Uh, I'm not sure if they don't have any fungal culture. If, if they don't have any fungal culture, that's that will be that will be very difficult to to prove the diagnosis. Yeah, but would you empirically treat these patients if well, you don't have anything? Any well, sort of this is, this is, I don't know if it's, if it's true that they do not have it, but hypothetically, if we do, then 
blindly, I mean blindly, um, it's better to refer them anyway. But if you can, like, you can try, I guess, and give something with uh, like etroconazole because the most common type is microsporic. Mm -hmm. And in, in, the, in the, the dark phototype, I mean, dark phototype patients, you can easily give etroconazole and, and get a, and, and you, you can, it will be fine for them. But I mean, if you don't have anything at all to prove it, it will be better to refer to some to, to someone else to, to, you know, to establish the correct diagnosis and to do the correct steps. Because at the end, it is, uh, it is um, contagious and we don't want the whole family having it. And we don't want to misjudge uh, it, misdiagnose or mistreat it as well, because it could be something else. It could not be uh, uh, capitis. So I'm not, I'm not in favor of just jumping in and blindly treating. But I guess if, we, if, if I, am, I am forced to uh, treat blindly, I will choose the troconazole or uh, on, uh, on terbinifine. Okay, and for how long would you treat them for? Oh, that varies. That varies. Six, six to eight weeks uh, for terbinafine, and some up uh, to eight weeks with with uh, with glucosaphalvine of twenty milligrams per kg. So it, it will take two two months, two months, two months and a half sometimes in, in these patients. Perfect. And do you need to do a liver function test? Well, that's a good question. Children, I mean, we can do that mostly in adults, but I, I, I rarely do that in, in children. In children, and I, actually, I do rarely do that in, 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 because I don't prescribe much of terbinafine unless they have some nail infection, for example. But I, re, I really, I, mean, I used to do it, and it's always, it's always normal. So I think it's always this. This this subject is very debatable. The way you know this, uh, but um, I think in adults we need to be more careful. In pediatric patients, it's okay. I think we can. Exactly. Yeah. I don't personally do it if it's a healthy person. I don't. If it's an old person with multiple uh, morbidity, comorbidities, then maybe, yes. Yeah, sure, you need to be very careful with that. I mean, the children are always good, so we find that. <laughs> okay. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, yeah. I do. Uh, is, tinea, is tinea infection contagious? Well, as we mentioned, I mean, tinea capitis is from animal to human. It depends on the type of it. Yeah, so would it be transmitted from a person to person? I think that's yeah, it depends. Things. It depends again. Sorry, it depends on the the slide here. The, the previous slide, as I mentioned, I don't know is it is the most common type. The tachyphytal transmission is human to human. Yes. But if it's another type, it's animal to human transmission. So it depends on the type of it. So you can't consider it. I mean, blindly that it, you can have it. The children between them, they can have it. Mm -hmm. uh, but it really depends on the type. Okay. In patients with molluscum contagiosum, would you ask them to stay home until it goes away? Or what do you tell them about the infectious risk and everything? Well, I won't ask them to stay home. It's not a horrible disease. Of course not. I mean, it's, yes, it could be contagious. That's true. They can cover it up and that will be fine. I mean, that's, that's mostly it. I won't, I won't tell them to stay home for, for the sake of other children. It's not, that, it's not that horrible of a disease. I mean, uh, they just can cover it. We just can treat it. Um, with the with the topical catalytics, of course, and we can cover it for for him not to to pick on it, for the child not to pick on it and touch other people. That's that that would be that would be fine. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, everyone is staying home, so that's that's not a problem. All children are staying home because of the online <laughs> teaching. But, but but I mean, in general, I w I won't recommend them. Say, uh, why would I do that <laughs> for for a small diagnosis? That is self limited. It's okay. Even if, what about tinea capitis? I think I think once I once I put them on treatment, then it will be fine. It will be fine. Perfect. Uh, let's go back to hemangioma. Can we do that? Uh, to yeah. questions about hemangiomas, because we have a lot. What is the difference between hemangiomas and nevus simplex? Oh, no, nevus simplex is something else. Um, hemangiomas, as I mentioned, is a tumor. Nevus yeah. simplex is mostly of of, again, it's, it's more of more of a capillary malformation. It's, it's nothing. It's not. It doesn't. It do, this is a completely different classification. It doesn't grow with time. It might stay there forever, but it doesn't grow with time, and then and then regresses. So, a hematoma is a tumor. It is not a a flat lesion. It is mm -hmm. a tumor. If you don't see a tumor that grew, that is not. Then it's not a hematoma. Usually. Yeah. Perfect. When do you consider it's too late for propranolol in hemangiomas? That question. That question. Oh, that's a huge debate. That's that's nice. Look, listen. 
um, when we started uh, the programa, we used to say, look, after 12 months, it won't be effective. And then we said, after 14 months, it will not be effective. Um, um, well, that, that's, that's a big one because I, I tried myself. I tried to do a trial myself with patients who had, who presented to me then fantahimajomas that did not, that passed, of course, a growing phase. And I started propanolol because the parents were fine. It's okay, let's, let's try this. And uh, they, they had it, they were like 16 months of age and it worked. So I think, I think I can start them up to 18 months. I know it would time it will, will lose their efficacy. It won't be that effective as when we start in the, in the growing phase. But still, I, I, I found a lot of efficacy. I'm working on this to, to establish uh, the perfect answer. But for sure that we all know what is very, very true is that uh, once you pass the growing phase, it will, it will be, it could be uh, effective, but not, not that effective. Like in the first four to six months, propranol will be effective. And then with time, it will lose its efficacy. And um, yeah, I guess, I guess it doesn't have, doesn't have, I still have this 14 months of age. I don't pass if it's more than 14 months, I don't give. I mean, theoretically, but I'm trying to work on a project where I can give in later age and see what's going on here. Yeah, that would be great. We still don't know the answer. So would you combine uh, oral propranolol with topical timolol? I do sometimes because look, um, when we have a, an, a, an infantile hemangioma that is a, the mixed type, we have the mixed type. The mixed type, because we have type, we have superficial and we have deep, and we have the mixed type, which we have the, we have the superficial component and we have a deep component of infantile hemangioma. So when we give the propranolol, the, the systemic type, the systemic treatment, it will work on the, will very fast on the deep component. Mm -hmm. um, with, so you can, you can giving the topical, like for a very, very small, once or twice, very small, um, two or three, um, whatever, dots of it, mm -hmm. can help in, in, in give, I mean, with the superficial component. Some, I know, I know some physicians, very, very big names that really do not like my, the topical, uh, mm -hmm. treatment at all. They believe that once you give topical, it will be absorbed and it will be in function as systemic. I really don't buy that yet. Mm -hmm. I think it's systemic is systemic and topical is topical. We don't, we're, not, we're not, I mean, bathing the baby with timolol. It's like very small dots with it. So um, um, I do sometimes give combined this. If, if, the, if the tumor is big and the, and the superficial component uh, can help me with that. Okay. And this is, okay. I have a very important question maybe that we need to stress on. Yes. Do family phys uh, physicians or general practitioners need to refer patients with hem hemangioma to dermatology or does it depend on the site? Should they always, you mean? Because they can, they can always. If it's a straightforward case, then as, as we mentioned in the presentation, they can, they can deal with it. But if, if, if they don't know or they want to refer, I mean, if that's your question, if they don't know and they want to refer, who should they to refer to? Um, I would like to say to, to the dermatologist, but I'm not sure if many of us know how to, to deal with it. On pediatric dermatologists, we're not, we're not that many. But um, yes, we can, we can deal with it. So you can uh, to, to refer to us, to pediatric dermatologists. And some pediatricians I know how, who, can, who, who have the experience to deal with. Um, when to do it, as we mentioned, if the location is questionable, like over the eye, over the nose, segmental uh, lesions, um, ulcerated lesions, mm. uh, lesions who can be cosmetically disfiguring over the nipples, over the private parts. Uh, yes, we need systemic treatment and you refer immediately. Mm -hmm. uh, would you, like, is there a number of hemangiomas that after that you would suspect internal ones, visceral uh, hemangiomas? I'm, I'm not, I, don't, I don't understand the question. How many hemangiomas? When would you expect visceral involvement? Visceral okay. hemangiomas? Oh, yes, that's true, that's true. yes. Um, so if it's more than five or six, then yes, I would always consider. It's always a borderline, you know, but you need to be in the safe side. Like some of them is more than five, more than six. Uh, some of them do not stress on it. I know many because uh, the, it's a small community. Pediatric dermatologists are, are, are not that number, number numerous. So we do discuss this all the time. And some do not really agree with the fact that they have only five or six, even though it's written in the textbooks because they have done so many ultrasounds, it's always negative. But still, we need to be careful. These are children, these are not uh, dolls. So we need, to, we need to always be careful. And an ultrasound is not invasive, so we can do that all the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, with time, we, might, we, can, we can, this is another idea that we can 
go again and try another trial and see if, if what was mentioned before is correct. Because, you know, most of the guidelines when they do it, they, they're not entirely, entirely um, uh, based on facts. Most of them just want to be in the safe side. So, exactly. so we, we just really, really need, to, need to know the correct answer on this. So now, most more than, if you see five or more, then you should consider visceral involvement, do ultrasound and, and, and continue the steps. Okay, perfect. Any symptoms, like uh, are there any alarming symptoms that would uh, make you think of visceral hemangiomas? I've never, I've never, um, um, uh, if there's bleeding, I, mean, I don't really want even to think about that. And I, mean, I don't want to freak out the audience, but if there, sometimes if it bleeds, then yes, we have, uh, you know, we have some bleeding on defecation. So yes, we need to think of that. It rarely happens. I think it never, I never saw a case. I, I don't know if you have seen a case. I've never seen a case, but you know, when, when, when you bleed sometimes, on a, on a, this, this we take with his, from history, a non-examination when you palpate and you see hepatomegaly, then yes, of course, you should, you should, you should think of it. This is mostly it. Yes. Uh, yeah. uh, important question, another one. Yes. Roll laser. Sorry? Hemangioma. Roll laser. laser. Vascular laser in hemangioma. Well, yes. it could be effective in ulcerated, in ulcerated lesions. Okay. But normal tumors, no. Okay. General anesthesia or for for laser? laser? With laser. Oh, you, you really you really want to deal with a three year old in laser who who is fully awake? You do not want. <laughs> you do not want that. So that's a that's another that's another obstacle because if you want to do laser, you need to, you need a, a, a GA, and that's not something the parents want. Not something not something you want with all the side effects that could happen and it really happens, but still it's a risk. Uh, just to do some three or four shots over the over the lesion and then. Uh, I mean, I mean, I, I, even if you, even if I, I'm in favor of it, I don't, I, I never men, met an, an anesthesiologist who will take it. You, they won't do it. They won't do it. It's not yes. just for, for a very, very um, benign tumor or lesion, whatever. It's not only for hematohematomas. You can see that in capillary malformations. It depends. But they won't do it. They won't do it. And uh, they, they will just say, okay, let's, listen, you can, they can grow with time. And once once they get older, we can do it where they awake with with topicals or with local injection, local anesthesia. anesthesia that's it. Yes. So, uh, and I would like to do. I mean, maybe in centers abroad, I'm not sure, but they will do that. But it's still, I mean, so, um, yeah, you don't want that. <laughs> it's tricky. Yes. Uh, okay. Can we move on now to atopic dermatitis? Because uh, because I has I have a lot of questions about allergy in general. Oh, I knew that. I knew that. I knew that they would ask these questions, and people yes. would say, "Yes, there are some allergies." And when did when they stopped that 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 milk, he got better. And no, you have no idea what you're talking about. I know. I know. Wallah, go ahead. <laughs> you know, there was a study that I read like a couple of weeks ago about allergy testing and the specialty. They saw that uh, pediatricians and allergologists are more inclined towards ordering allergy tests. Oh, they love that. They love that. I, I love my physicians, but they love doing that. They love it. Even one third of allergologists ordered blood uh, allergy testing without any clinical indication. This so it's, uh, yeah, it's a debatable topic for them. It's always debatable. I mean, pediatricians yeah. will not like us, will not like us if we, if we say otherwise. So anyway, give on the first one. Okay. Can high pool allergenic milk formula uh, improve atopic dermatitis? Well, again, I mean, as we have mentioned, this is, this is a broad question. Mm. Uh, if, why are you giving it hypoallergenic? Because you think, or do you think is that the flare is from the, from the milk? If you think of that, then that's not very true. Yeah. Um, you need to treat the atopic dermatitis before thinking that, before changing any milk. Before changing anything, because it's a genetic, it's a genetic disease. You know that it's it's, it's in the, it's in our it's in their genes mostly. So they need to treat the top of the 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 top of dermatitis, and then and then wait and see. Treat it once they go away. They just continue normally on their on, on their milk. If if it's fine, then it's fine. If they're still fine, that with their milk that they are giving, that they have the, these flare ups, because as I mentioned, they have the tendency they more that the tendency to have flare ups with allergens. Then okay, fine, you can switch. But do not give the message that this child is allergic to that milk. 
that's what I wanted to say. You know what the problem is that I've faced? That the, there are some spe specific specialties or maybe some doctors that have a ready-made list with food to avoid. And they give them to every patient with a topic dermatitis. You don't drink that, you don't eat that, you don't do that. Oh, my dear God. As, as I mentioned, because when you do that, you, I mean, I mean, do you think that, that really this is easy? Are they helping the baby really? I mean, really? Are they helping the baby? Like, do not eat that. Do not eat this. Do not change your cream, change your milk, change your clothes, change everything. And if the mother's lactating, don't eat whatever whatever she's eating. And she's it's like it's like it's a topic of It's easier than that. It's much much easier than that. Don't yeah. Don't go make their lives hell. Like it's not that it's not that of a problem. Especially mild to moderate and mild mild. We see that many 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 cases nowadays, especially in this season. And we don't we we're not necessarily. The, the, the key point is just to treat the atopic dermatitis, as we have mentioned, with topicals, and then you see. Don't make their life a roller coaster. Do not make that. It's, it's easier. It's, more, it's more, more easier than that. Yes, they're more susceptible to other stuff. They're more susceptible to, to, to allergens. That's true. They're more susceptible to infections. But, but once they are treated, then they are fine. They have the skin barrier intact. Everything is good. Yes. I agree completely. Hopefully, the practice will change in the future. Hopefully. Yes. So is there any similarity between hemangioma and pyogenic granuloma? Oh, oh, that's another tumor. That's very good. That's a vascular tumor. So pyogenic granuloma, they, they, it bleeds because it's, it, comes, it comes in any age, of course. It can be in any age. It's a, it's a tumor that, that when, you, when you dig in the history, that just after any trauma that caused this proliferation of, of cells, of endothelial cells that, that came and it bleeds nonstop. You need mm -hmm. to remove it surgically or you need to whatever, cryotherapy or just remove it surgically to remove this tumor to stop the bleeding. It's not, um, it's not an, an, an infantile hemangioma is completely different. As I mentioned, it starts as a small precursor, small red um, macule, and then it grows with time, then stops, and then it aggresses with time, that's it. Pyogenic granuloma is acute. You just find it suddenly after a tumor, after a trauma, and 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 it just proliferates very fast and it bleeds nonstop, wherever. I mean, over the face, over the um, over the extremities, wherever. And the only way that you need to treat this is just to remove it, excise it, or or treat it in, in any destructive method. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. So we tend to see pyogenic granuloma in older people. That's and true. That's an older, an older patient. That's true. We don't see that in very young as as in the damage. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you very much, Dr. Abdullah. I think we're happy with uh, this amount of questions that you've answered. Thank you very much for this amazing Thank lecture. You. Thank you. And now I'll give the mic to uh, my friend in the organizing committee, Dr. Abdelaziz, to conclude this session and this course. Here you go. Thank you, Dr. Loy. Okay, so I just wanted to say thank you so, so much for everyone who attended yesterday and today. I really, really hope that you enjoyed it. I really hope that you got to learn something new that will help you with your daily practice when it comes to dermatological conditions and skin conditions overall. Based on the comments, the reviews, the number of registrations, and the number of participants up until this minute, which is the maximum, I would say that hopefully the conference was a success. Obviously, there's still a lot of room for improvement. This is only our first year, our first attempt at it, um, which takes me to the next point. There will be uh, a survey that will be sent to all your emails in the next couple of days. So please be kind and fill the survey out let us know how the conference went. Most importantly, let us know how we can improve this conference in the upcoming years. I also have good news. The whole conference was recorded. All the talks from all the speakers, um, you'll be able to access at any point in the future. Uh, and this will be uh, present in the Saudi Society of Dermatology website, ssdds.org, and also on the Saudi Society of Dermatology YouTube channel. 
Uh, I would also like to say that um, the CME hours, uh, everybody who registered uh, and attended will hopefully be eligible uh, to receive their CME hours once they are processed uh, by the Saudi Commission of Health uh, Specialties. I would like to take this opportunity again to thank the Saudi society led by Dr. Sami Swedan for again giving us this opportunity uh, to give you uh, uh, this uh, great event and course that will hopefully continue for many years. Um, I would also like to thank our sponsors, uh, Lily, um, for sponsoring this event, and also like to thank Infotech uh, for helping us launch this event. A very special thank you to my colleagues, Dr. Luay Salah, Dr. Lama Tawil, for your nonstop efforts to help make this happen. Thank you. Without your help, we wouldn't have been able to uh, organize this event. Thank you to all our speakers. I think we all agree that they were great. They did a wonderful job. Thank you for your valuable time and for um, uh, all your great uh, talks. Um, I really hope that um, we'll get together again next year, hopefully uh, an even better uh, conference uh, that we can uh, improve on. And most importantly, I hope that it won't be virtual. I really hope that next year uh, we get to do a live conference uh, where we get to meet face and face and interact one specialty to another. Um, I really hope inshallah that this will happen uh, next year. So with that, I would like to say, please enjoy your rest of the night um, and see you next year. Fi amanillah, ma'as salamah.